Section One of Null A B C. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Schultz. Null A B C by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. Chester Pelton retracted his paunch as far as the breakfast seat would permit. The table, its advent preceded by a collection of mouth-watering aromas, slid noiselessly out of the pantry and clicked into place in front of him. "'Everything all right, Miss Clare?' a voice floated out after it from beyond. "'Anything else you want?' "'Everything's just fine, Mrs. Harris,' Clare replied. "'I suppose Mr. Pelton will want seconds, and Ray will probably want thirds and fourths of everything.' She waved a hand over the photocell that closed the pantry door, and slid into place across from her brother, who already had a glass of fruit juice in one hand, and was lifting platter covers with the other. "'Real eggs!' the boy was announcing. "'Bacon! Wheat bread toast!' He looked again. "'Hey, sis, is this real cow-made butter?' "'Yes. Now go ahead and eat.' As though Ray needed encouragement, Chester Pelton thought, watching his son use a spoon, the biggest one available, to dump gobs of honey on his toast. While he was helping himself to bacon and eggs, he could hear Ray's full-mouthed exclamation, "'This is real bee-comb honey, too!' That pleased him. The boy was a true Pelton, only needed one bite to distinguish between real and synthetic food. "'Bet this breakfast didn't cost a dollar under five C,' Ray continued, a little more audibly, between bites. That was another Pelton trait. Even at fifteen, the boy was learning the value of money. Claire seemed to disapprove, however. "'Oh, Ray, try not to always think of what things cost,' she reproved. "'If I had all she spends on natural food, I could have a this-season's model copter bike, just like Jimmy Hartnett.' Ray continued. Pelton frowned. I don't want you running around with that boy, Ray, he said, his mouth full of bacon and eggs. Under his daughter's look of disapproval, he swallowed hastily, then continued. He's not the sort of company I want my son keeping. But, Senator, Ray protested, he lives next door to us. Why, we can see Hartnett's aerial from the top of our landing stage. That doesn't matter he said, in a tone meant to indicate that the subject was not to be debated. He's illiterate. More eggs, Senator? Claire asked, extending the platter and gesturing with the serving knife. He chuckled inwardly. Claire always knew what to do when his tempers started climbing to critical mass. He allowed her to load his plate again. And speaking of our landing stage, have you been up there this morning, Ray? he asked. They both looked at him inquiringly. "'Delivered last evening, while you two were out,' he explained. "'New winter model rolls caddy pack. He felt a glow of paternal pleasure as Claire gave a yelp of delight and aimed a glancing kiss at the top of his bald head. Ray dropped his fork, slid from his seat, and bolted for the lift, even bacon, eggs, and real bee-comb honey forgotten. With elaborate absent-mindedness, Chester Pelton reached for the switch to turn on the video screen over the pantry door. Uh-uh, uh-uh, Claire's slender hand went out to stop his own. Not till coffee and cigarettes, Senator. It's almost 0815. I want the newscast. Can't you just relax for a while? Honestly, Senator, you're killing yourself. Oh, rubbish. I've been working a little hard, but... You've been working too hard. And today, with the sale at the store? And the last day of the campaign? Why the devil did that idiot of a ladder man have the sale advertised for today, anyhow? He fumed. Doesn't he know I'm running for the Senate? I doubt it, Claire said. He may have heard of it, the way you've heard about an election in Pakistan or Abyssinia, or he just may not know there is such a thing as politics. I think he does know there's a world outside the store, but he doesn't care much what goes on in it. She pushed her plate aside, poured a cup of coffee, and levered a cigarette from the ready-lit, puffing at it with the relish of the morning's first smoke. All he knows is that we're holding our sale three days ahead of Macy and Gimbel's. Russ is a good businessman, Pelton said seriously. 
I wish you'd take a little more interest in him, Claire. If you mean what I think you do, no thanks, Claire replied. I suppose I'll get married some day, most girls do, but it'll be to somebody who can hang his business up at the office before he comes home. Russ Latterman is so married to the store that if he married me, too, it'd be bigamy. Ready for your coffee? Without waiting for an answer, she filled his cup and ejected a lighted cigarette from the box for him, then snapped on the video screen. It lit at once, and a nondescriptly handsome young man was grinning toothily out of it. He wore a white smock, halfway to his knees, and over it an old-fashioned Sam Brown belt, which supported a bulky leather-covered tablet and a large stylus. On the strap which crossed his breast, five or six little metal badges twinkled. Why, no other beer can compare with delicious tangy Cardin's Black Bottle. Won't you try it? he pleaded. Then you will see for yourself why millions of happy drinkers always call for Cardin's. And now, that other favorite of millions, literate first-class Elliot C. Mongery. Pelton muttered, Why, Frank sponsors that blabbermouth of a mongery. Ray, sliding back onto the bench, returned to his food. Jimmy's book had pictures he complained, forking up another mixture of eggs, bacon, toast, and honey. Book? Claire echoed. Oh, the instructions for the copter? Pipe down, both of you, Pelton commanded. The newscast. Literate first-class Elliot C. Mongery, revealed by a quick left quarter turn of the pickup camera, wore the same starchy white smock, the same Sam Brown belt glittering with the badges of the organizations and corporations for whom he was authorized to practice literacy. The tablet on his belt, Pelton knew, was really a camouflaged holster for a small automatic, and the gold stylus was a gas projector. The black leather-jacketed bodyguards, of course, were discreetly out of range of the camera. Members of the Associated Fraternities of Literates weren't exactly loved by the non-reading public they claimed to serve. The sight of one of those starchy, perpetually spotless, white smocks always affected Pelton like a red cape to a bull. He snorted in disdain. The raised eyebrow toward the announcer on the left, the quick, perennially boyish smile, followed by the lovely, serious gaze into the camera. The whole act might have been a film transcription of Mongery's first appearance on the video fifteen years ago. At least, it was off the same ear of corn. That big hunk of cheese, Ray commented. For once, Pelton didn't shush him. That was too close to his own attitude, at least in family breakfast table terminology. First of all, for the country, and especially the newer New York area, and, by the way, it looks as though somebody thought somebody needed a little cooling off, but we'll come to that later. Here's the forecast. Today and tomorrow, the weather will continue fine. Warm in the sun, chilly in the shadows. There won't be anything to keep you from the poles tomorrow except bird hunting or a last chance at a game of golf. This is the first time within this commentator's memory that the weather has definitely been in favor of the party out of power. On the world scene, you'll be glad to hear that the survivors of the wrecked straddle rocket have all been rescued from the top of Mount Everest after a difficult and heroic effort by the Royal Nepalese Air Force. The results of last week's election in Russia are being challenged by twelve of the fourteen parties represented on the ballot. The only parties not hurling accusations of fraud are the Democrats, who won, and the Christian Communists, who are about as influential in Russian politics as the Vegetarian Anti-Vaccination Party is here. The Central Diplomatic Council of the Reunited Nations has just announced, for the hundred and seventy-eighth time, that the Arab-Israel dispute has been finally definitely and satisfactorily settled. This morning's reports from Baghdad and Tel Aviv only list four Arabs and six Israelis killed in border clashes in the past 24 hours, so maybe they're really getting things patched up after all. During the same period, there were more fatalities in newer New York as a result of clashes between the private troops of rival racket gangs, political parties, and business houses. Which brings us to the local scene. On my way to the studio this morning, I stopped at City Hall and found our genial Chief of Police Delaney, Irish Delaney to most of us, hard at work with a portable disintegrator, 
getting rid of record discs and recording tapes of old and long-settled cases. He had a couple of amusing stories. For instance, a lone independent conservative partisan broke up a radical socialist mass meeting preparatory to a march to demonstrate in Double Times Square by applying his pocket lighter to one of the heat-sensitive boxes in the building and activating the sprinkler system. By the time the radicals had gotten into dry clothing, there was a, well, sort of, impromptu conservative demonstration going on in Double Times Square, and one of the few things the local gendarmes won't stand for is an attempt to hold two rival political meetings in the same area. Curiously, while it was the radicals who got soaked, it was the conservatives who sneezed. Mongery went on, his face glowing with mischievous amusement. It seems that while they were holding a monster rally at Hague Hall, in North Jersey Borough, some person, or persons unknown, got at the air-conditioning system with a tank of sneeze gas, which didn't exactly improve either the speaking style of Senator Grant Hamilton or the attentiveness of his audience. Needless to say, there is no police investigation of either incident. Election shenanigans, like college pranks, are fair play, as long as they don't cause an outright holocaust. And that, I think, is as it should be. Mongery went on more seriously. Most of the horrors of the twentieth and twenty-first centuries were the result of taking politics too seriously. Pelton snorted again. That was the literate line, all right. Treat politics as a joke and an election as a sporting event. Let the independent conservative grafters stay in power and let the literates run the country through them. Not, of course, that he disapproved of those boys in the Young Radical League who'd thought up that sneeze-gas trick. And now, what you've been waiting for, Mongery continued, the final Trotter Poll's pre-election analysis. A novice literate advanced, handing him a big, loose-leaf book, which he opened with the reverence a literate always displayed toward the written word. This, he said, is going to surprise you. For the whole state of Penn, Jersey, York, the poll shows a probable radical socialist vote of approximately thirty million, an independent conservative vote of approximately ten and a half million, and a vote of about a million for what we call the Who Gives a Damn Party, which, frankly, is the party of your commentator's choice. Very few sections differ widely from this average. There will be a much heavier radical vote in the Pittsburgh area, and traditionally conservative Philadelphia and the upper Hudson Valley will give the radicals a much smaller majority. They all looked at one another, thunderstruck. If Mongery's admitting that, I'm in, Pelton exclaimed. Yeah, we can start calling him senator now and really mean it, Ray said. Maybe old Mongey isn't such a bad sort of twerp after all. Considering that the conservatives carried this state by a substantial majority in the presidential election of two years ago, and by a huge majority in the previous presidential election of 2136, Mongery in the screen continued, this verdict of the almost infallible Trotter poll needs some explaining. For the most part, it is the result of the untiring efforts of one man, the dynamic new leader of the radical socialists, and their present candidate for the Consolidated States of North America, Senate, Chester Pelton, who has transformed that once moribund party into the vital force it is today. And this achievement has been due very largely to a single slogan which he had hammered into your ears. Put the literates in their place our servants, not our masters. He brushed a hand deprecatingly over his white smock and fingered the badges on his belt. There has always been, on the part of the illiterate public, some resentment against organized literacy. In part, it has been due to the high fees charged for literate services and to what seems, to many, to be monopolistic practices. But behind that is a general attitude of anti-intellectualism which is our heritage from the disastrous wars of the twentieth and twenty-first centuries. Chester Pelton has made himself the spokesman of this attitude. In his view, it was men who could read and write who hatched the diabolical political ideologies and designed the frightful nuclear weapons of that period. In his mind, literacy is equated with Mein Kampf and Das Kapital with the A-bomb and the H-bomb, with concentration camps and blasted cities. From this position, of course, I beg politely to differ. 
literate men also gave us the magna carta and the declaration of independence now in spite of a lunatic fringe in the consolidated illiterates organization who want just that chester pelton knows that we cannot abolish literacy entirely even with modern audiovisual recording need exists for some modicum of written recording which can be rapidly scanned and selected from indexing cataloging tabulating data etc and for at least a few men and women who can form and interpret the written word mr pelton himself is the owner of a huge department store employing over a thousand illiterates he must at all times have the services of at least fifty literates and pays through the nose for them too pelton growled it was more than fifty and russ latterman had been forced to get twenty extras sent in for the sale now since we cannot renounce literacy entirely without sinking to fellahin barbarism and here i definitely part company with mr pelton he fears the potential power of organized literacy in a word he fears a future literate dictatorship future what do you think we have now pelton demanded nobody mongery said as though replying to him is stupid enough today to want to be a dictator that ended by the middle of the twenty-first century everybody knows what happened to mussolini and hitler and stalin and all their imitators why it is as much the public fear of big government as the breakdown of civil power because of the administrative handicap of a shortage of literate administrators that is responsible for the disgraceful lawlessness of the past hundred years thus it speaks well for the public trust in chester pelton's known integrity and sincerity that so many of our people are willing to agree to his program for socialized literacy they feel he can be trusted and violently as i disagree with him i can only say that that trust is not misplaced of course there is also the question so often raised by mr pelton that under the hamilton machine the politics and particularly the enforcement of the laws in this state are unbelievably corrupt but i wonder mongery paused just a moment i see a flash bulletin being brought in the novice literate came to his side and gave him a slip of paper at which he glanced then he laughed heartily it seems that shortly after i began speaking the local blue ribbon grand jury issued a summons for chief delaney to appear before them with all his records unfortunately the summons could not be served chief delaney had just boarded a straddle rocket from tom dewey field for buenos aires he cocked an eye at the audience i know irish is going to have a nice time down there in the springtime of the southern hemisphere and incidentally the argentine is one of the few major powers which never signed the world extradition convention of twenty eighty seven he raised his hand to his audience and now until tomorrow at breakfast sincerely yours for cardin's black bottle elliot c mongery well what do you know that guy was plugging for you ray said and see how he managed to slide in that bit about corruption right before his stooge handed him that bulletin i guess every literate has his price chester pelton said i wonder how much of my money that cost i always wondered why frank cardin sponsored mongery now i know mongery can be had uh beg your pardon mr pelton a voice from the hall broke in he turned olaf olafsson the copter driver was standing at the entrance to the breakfast nook a smudge of oil on his cheek and his straw-colored hair in disorder how do i go about startin this new copter what olaf had been his driver for ten years he would have been less surprised had the ceiling fallen in you don't know how to start it no sir the controls is all different from on the summer model every time i try to raise it it backs up if i try to raise it much more we won't have no wall left on the landing stage well isn't there a book there ain't no pictures in it nothing but print it's a literate book olaf said in disgust as though at something obscene and there ain't nothing on the instrument board but letters that's right ray agreed i saw the book no pictures in it at all 
well of all the quarter-witted stupidity the confounded imbeciles at that agency pelton started to his feet claire unlocked the table and slid it out of his way ray on a run started for the lift and vanished i think some confounded literate at the rolls catapack agency did that he fumed thought it would be a joke to send me a literate instruction book along with a copter with a literate instrument board ah i get it so i'd have to call in a literate to show me how to start my own copter and by noon they'd be laughing about it in every bar from pittsburgh to plattsburgh sneaky literate trick they went to the lift and found the door closed in their faces oh confound that boy claire pressed the button ray must have left the lift for the operating light went on and in a moment the door opened he crowded into the lift along with his daughter and olaf on the landing stage ray was already in the copter poking at buttons on the board look olaf he called they just shifted them around a little from the summer model this one where the prop control used to be on the old model is the one that backs it up on the ground here's the one that erects and extends the prop he pushed it and the prop snapped obediently into place and here's the one that controls the lift an ugly suspicion stabbed at chester pelton bringing with it a feeling of frightened horror how do you know he demanded ray's eyes remained on the instrument board he pushed another button and the propeller began swinging in a lazy circle he pressed down with his right foot and the copter lifted a foot or so what he asked oh jimmy showed me how theirs works mr hartnett got one like it a week ago he motioned to olaf setting the copter down again come here i'll show you the suspicion and the horror passed in a wave of relief you think you and olaf between you can get that thing to school he asked sure easy all right you show olaf how to run it Olaf, as soon as you've dropped Ray at school, take that thing to the Rolls Catapack Agency and get a new one with a proper instrument board and a proper picture book of operating instructions. I'm going to call Sam Hushak up personally and give him royal hell about this. Sure you can handle it now? He watched the copter rise to the 2,000-foot local traffic level and turn in the direction of Mineola High School, 50 miles away. He was still looking anxiously after it as it dwindled to a tiny dot and vanished. "'They'll make it all right,' Claire told him. "'Olaf has a strong back, and Ray has a good head.' "'It wasn't that that I was worried about.' He turned and looked, half ashamed, at his daughter. "'You know, for a minute there, I thought—I thought Ray could read.' "'Father!' she was so shocked that she forgot the nickname they had given him when he had announced his candidacy for senate in the spring you didn't i know it's an awful thing to think but well the kids today do the craziest things there's that hartnett boy he runs around with tom hartnett bought literate training for him and that fellow prestonby i don't trust him prestonby claire asked puzzled oh you know the principal at school you've met him claire wrinkled her brow just like her mother when she was trying to remember something oh yes i met him at that pta meeting he didn't impress me as being much like a teacher but i suppose they think anything's good enough for us illiterates literate first class ralph n prestonby remained standing by the lectern looking out over the crowded auditorium still pleasantly surprised to estimate the day's attendance at something like ninety-seven per cent of enrollment that was really good why it was only three per cent short of perfect maybe it was the new rule requiring a sound recorded excuse for absence or it could have been his propaganda campaign about the benefits of education or very easily it could have been the result of sending doug yetzko and some of his boys around to talk to recalcitrant parents it was good to see that that was having some effect beside an increase in the number of attempts on his life or the flood of complaints to the board of education well lansdale had gotten education merged with his office of communications and lansdale was back of him to the limit so the complaints had died out on the empty air and doug yetzko was his bodyguard so most of the would-be assassins had died also the north american anthem which had replaced the star-spangled banner after the united states canadian mexican merger came to an end 
The students and their white-smocked teachers below relaxed from attention. Most of them sat down, while monitors and teachers in the rear were getting the students into the aisles and marching them off to study halls and classrooms and workshops. The orchestra struck up a lively march tune. He leaned his left elbow, literates learned early, or did not live to learn, not to immobilize the right hand, on the lectern and watched the interminable business of getting the students marched out, yearning, as he always did at this time, for the privacy of his office where he could smoke his pipe. Finally they were all gone, and the orchestra had gathered up its instruments and filed out into the wings of the stage, and he looked up to the left and said softly, All right, Doug, show's over. With a soft thud, the big man dropped down from the guard's cubicle overhead, grinning cheerfully. He needed a shave, Yetzko always did in the mornings, and in his leather literate's guard uniform he looked like some ogreish giant out of the mythology of the past. I was glad to have you up there with the big noise this morning, Preston B. said. What a mob! I'm still trying to figure out why we have such an attendance. Don't you get it, Captain? Yetzko was reaching up to lock the door of his cubicle. He seemed surprised at Prestonby's obtuseness. Day before election. The little darlings, moms and pops don't want them out running around. We can look for another big crowd tomorrow, too. Prestonby gave a snort of disgust. Of course. How imbecilic can I really get? I didn't notice any of them falling down, so I suppose you didn't see anything out of line? Well, the hall monitors make them turn in their little playthings at the doors, Yetzko said, but hall monitors can be gotten at, and some of the stuff they make in manual training when nobody's watching them. Prestonby nodded. Just a week before, a crude but perfectly operative 17 millimeter shotgun had been discovered in the last stages of manufacture in the machine shop, and five out of six of the worn-out files would vanish, to be ground down into dirks, he often thought of the stories of his grandfather, who had been a major during the occupation of Russia after the Fourth World War. Those old-timers didn't know how easy they'd had it. They should have tried to run an illiterate high school. Yetzko was still grumbling slanders on the legitimacy of the student body. One of those little angels shoots me, and it's just a cute little prank, and we oughtn't to frown on the little darling when it's just trying to express its dear little personality, or we might give it complexes or something. He falsettoed incongruously. And if the little darling's mistake doesn't kill me outright and I shoot back, people talk about King Herod. He used language about the Board of Education and the tax-paying public that was probably subversive within the meaning of the loyalty oath. I wish I had a pair of 40 millimeter auto cannons up there instead of that sono gun. Each class is a little worse than the one before. In about five years, they'll be making H-bombs in the lab, Prestonby said. In the last week, a dozen pupils had been seriously cut or blackjacked in hall and locker room fights. Nice citizens of the future. Nice future to look forward to growing old in. We won't, Yetzko comforted him. We can't be lucky all the time. In about a year, they'll find both of us stuffed into a broom closet, when they start looking around to see what's making all the stink. Prestonby took the thick-barreled gas pistol from the shelf under the lectern and shoved it into his hip pocket. Yetzko picked up a two-and-a-half-foot length of rubber hose and tucked it under his left arm. Together they went back through the wings and out into the hallway that led to the office. So a twenty-second century high school was a place where a teacher carried a pistol and a tear-gas projector and a sleep-gas gun and had a bodyguard, and still walked in danger of his life from armed teenage hooligans. It was meaningless to ask whose fault it was. There had been the world wars, and the Cold War interbellum periods, rising birth rates, huge demands on the public treasury for armaments, with the public taxed to the saturation point, and no money left for the schools. There had been fantastic, progressive education experiments, even in the fifties of the twentieth century. In the big cities, children were being pushed through grade school without having learned to read. And when there had been money available for education, school boards had insisted on spending it for audiovisual equipment, recordings, films, anything but textbooks. And there had been that lunatic theory that children should be taught to read by recognizing whole words instead of learning the alphabet. 
and more and more illiterates had been shoved out of the schools into a world where radio and television and moving pictures were supplanting books and newspapers and more and more children of illiterates had gone to school without any desire or incentive to learn to read and finally the illiterates had become illiterates and literacy had become literacy and now the associated fraternities of literates had come to monopolize the ability to read and write and a few men like william r lansdale with a handful of followers like ralph n prestonby were trying the gleaming cleanliness of the corridor as always heartened prestonby a little it was a trophy of victory from his first two days at mineola high school three years ago he remembered what they had looked like when he had first seen them this school is a pigpen he had barked at the janitorial force and even if they are illiterates these children aren't pigs they deserve decent surroundings this school will be cleaned immediately from top to bottom and it'll be kept that way the janitors all political appointees independent conservative party hacks secure in their jobs had laughed derisively the building superintendent without troubling to rise had answered him young man you don't want to get off on the wrong foot here he had said this here's the way this school's always been run and it's gonna take a lot more than you to change it the fellow's name he recalled was kettner lansdale had given him a briefing which had included some particulars about him he was an independent conservative ward committee man he had gotten his present job after being fired from his former position as mailman for listening to other people's mail with his pocket recorder reproducer yetsko he had said kick this bum out on his face you can't get away with kettner had begun yetsko had yanked him out of his chair with one hand and started for the door with him just a moment yetsko he had said thinking that he was backing down they had all begun grinning at him don't bother opening the door he had said just kick him out after the third kick kettner had gotten the door open himself the fourth kick sent him across the hall to the opposite wall he pulled himself to his feet and limped away never to return the next morning the school was spotless it had stayed that way beside him yetsko must also have returned mentally to the past looks better now than it did when we first saw it captain he said yes it didn't take us as long to clean up this mess as it did to clean up that mutinous guards company in pittsburgh but when we cleaned that up it stayed clean this is like trying to bail out a boat with a pitchfork yeah i wish we'd had stayed in pittsburgh captain i wish we'd never seen this place so do i prestonby agreed heartily no he didn't either if he'd never have come to mineola high school he'd never have found claire pelton end of section one Section 2 of Null ABC by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karina Schultz. Sitting down again at the breakfast table with her father, Claire levered another cigarette out of the ready lit and puffed at it with exaggeratedly bored slowness. She was still frightened. Ray shouldn't have done what he did, even if he had furnished a plausible explanation. The trouble with plausible explanations was having to make them. Sooner or later you made too many, and then you made one that wasn't so plausible. And then all the others were remembered, and they all looked phony. And why had the senator had to mention Ralph? Was he beginning to suspect the truth about that, too? I hope not, she thought desperately. If he ever found out about that, it'd kill him. Just kill him, period. Mrs. Harris must have turned off the video after they had gone up to the landing stage. To cover her nervousness, she reached up and snapped it on again. The screen lit, and from it a young man with dark eyes under bushy black brows was shouting angrily.
most obvious sort of conspiracy if the radical socialist party leaders or the consolidated illiterates organization political action committee need any further evidence of the character of their candidate and idolized leader chester pelton the treatment given to pelton's candidacy by literate first-class elliot c mongery this morning ought to be sufficient to remove the scales from the eyes of the blindest of them I won't state in so many words that Chester Pelton sold out the Radical Socialists and the Consolidated Illiterates Organization to the Associated Fraternities of Literates, because, since no witness to any actual transfer of money can be found, such a statement would be libelous, provided Pelton had nerve enough to sue me. Why, you dirty, misbegotten, illegitimate... Pelton was on his feet. His hand went to his hip and then, realizing that he was unarmed, and in any case confronted only by an electronic image, he sat down again. "'Pelton's been yapping for socialized literacy,' the man on the screen continued. "'I'm not going back to the old argument that any kind of socialization is only the thin edge of the wedge which will pry open the pit of horrors from which the world has climbed since the Fourth World War. If you don't realize that now, it's no use for me to repeat it again. But... I will ask you, do you realize for a moment what a program of socialized literacy would mean, apart from the implications of any kind of socialization? It would mean that inside of five years the literates would control the whole government. They control the courts now. Only a literate can become a lawyer, and only a lawyer can become a judge. They control the armed forces. Only a literate can enter West Point or Fort McKenzie or Chapultepec or White Sands or Annapolis. And if Chester Pelton's socialization scheme goes into effect, there will be no branch of the government which will not be completely under the control of the Associated Fraternities of Literates. The screen went suddenly dark. Her father turned to catch her with her hand still on the switch. Put it back on. I want to hear what that lying pimp of a Slade gardener is saying about me. Phooey, you'd have shot it out yourself if you'd had your gun on. I saw you reaching for it. Now be quiet and take it easy, she ordered. He reached toward the ready lit for a cigarette, then his hand stopped. His face was contorted with pain. He gave a gasp of suffocation. Claire cried in dismay. You're not going to have another of those attacks. Where are the nitrocaine bulbs? don't have any here some at the office but i told you to get more she accused oh i don't need them really his voice was steadier now the spasm of pain had passed he filled his coffee cup and sipped from it turn on the video again claire i want to hear what that gardener's saying i will not don't you have people at party headquarters monitoring this stuff well then somebody'll prepare an answer if he needs answering. I think he does. A lot of these dumbbells will hear that and believe it. I'll talk to Frank. He'll know what to do. Frank again. She frowned. Look, Senator, you think Frank Cardin's your friend? But I don't trust him. I never could, she said. I think he's utterly and entirely unscrupulous. Amoral, I believe, is the word. Like a savage or a pirate or one of the old-time Nazis or communists. Oh, Claire, her father protested. Frank's in a tough business. You have no idea the lengths competition goes to in the beer business. And he's been in politics and dealing with racketeers and labor unions all his life. But he's a good, sound illiterate, family illiterate for four generations like ours. And I'd trust him with anything. You heard this fellow, Mongery. <laughs> I always have to pause to keep from calling him Mongrel saying that I deserve the credit for pulling the radicals out of the mud and getting the party back on the tracks? Well, I couldn't have begun to do it without Frank Cardin. Frank Cardin stood on the sidewalk, looking approvingly into the window of O'Reilly's Tavern, in which his display crew had already set up the spread for the current week. On either side was a giant six-foot replica in black glass of the Cardin bottle in the conventional shape accepted by an illiterate public as containing beer, bearing the red Cardin label with its pictured bottle in a central white disc. Because of the heroic size of the bottles, the pictured bottle on the label bore a bottle bearing a label bearing a bottle bearing a bottle on a label. 
he counted eight pictured bottles down to the tiniest dot of black there were four-foot bottles next to the six-foot bottles and three-foot bottles next to them and in the middle background a life-size tridimensional picture of an almost nude and incredibly pulchritudinous young lady smiling in invitation at the passing throng and extending a foaming bottle of cardons in her hand aside from the printed trademark registry statements on the labels there was not a printed word visible in the window he pushed through the swinging doors and looked down the long room with the chairs still roosting sleepily on the tables and made a quick count of the early drinkers two-thirds of them in white smocks and sam brown belts obviously from literates hall across the street late drinkers he corrected himself mentally they'd be the night shift having their drinks before going home good morning mr cardon the bartender greeted him still drinking your own hasn't poisoned me yet cardon told him or anybody else he folded a sea bill accordion wise and set it on edge on the bar give everybody what they want drink up gentlemen and have one on mr cardon the bartender announced then lowered his voice o'reilly wants to see you about he gave a barely perceptible nod in the direction of the building across the street yes i want to see him too cardon poured from the bottle in front of him accepted the thanks of the house and when the bartender brought the fifteen dollars odd change from the dozen drinks he pushed it back he drank slowly looking around the room then set down his empty glass and went back past two doors which bore pictured half doors revealing respectively masculine trousered and feminine stockinged ankles and opened the unmarked office door beyond the bartender he knew had pushed the signal button the door was unlocked and inside o'reilly baptismal name luigi o'reilly was waiting chief wants to see you right away the saloon keeper said the brewer nodded all right keep me covered don't know how long i'll be he crossed the room and opened a corner cupboard stepping inside the corner cupboard which was an elevator took him to a tunnel below the street across the street he entered another elevator set the indicator for the tenth floor and ascended as the car rose he could feel the personality of frank cardon illiterate brewer drop from him as though he were an actor returning from the stage to his dressing-room the room into which he emerged was almost that there was a long table at which two white smocked literates drank coffee and went over some papers a third literate sprawled in a deep chair resting at a small table four men in black shirts and leather breeches and field boots played poker while a fifth who had just entered and had not yet removed his leather helmet and jacket or his weapons belt stood watching them cardon went to a row of lockers along the wall opened one and took out a white smock pulling it over his head and zipping it up to the throat then he buckled on a sam brown with its tablet holster and stylus gas projector the literate sprawling in the chair opened one eye hi frank feels good to have them on again doesn't it yes clean cardon replied it'll be just for half an hour but he passed through the door across from the elevator went down a short hall and spoke in greeting to the leather-jacketed stormtrooper on guard outside the door at the other end mr cardon the guard nodded mr lansdale's expecting you so i understand bert he opened the door and went through william r lansdale rose from behind his desk and advanced to greet him with a quick handshake guiding him to a chair beside the desk as he did he sniffed and raised an eyebrow beer this early frank he asked morning noon and night chief cardon replied when you said this job was going to be dangerous i didn't know you meant that it would lead straight to an alcoholic's grave let me get you a cup of coffee and a cigar then the white-haired literate executive resumed his seat passing a hand back and forth slowly across the face of the commo the diamond on his finger twinkling and gave brief instructions and just relax for a minute you have a tough job this time frank they were both silent as a novice literate bustled in with coffee and individually sealed cigars. At least you're not one of these plain living and right-thinking fanatics like Wilton Joyner and Harvey Graves, Corden said. On top of everything else, that I could not take. 
Lansdale's thin face broke into a smile, little wrinkles putting his mouth in parentheses. Cardin sampled the coffee, and then used a sixteenth-century Italian stiletto from Lansdale's desk to perforate the end of his cigar. "'Much as I hate it, I'll have to get out of here as soon as I can,' he said. "'I don't know how long O'Reilly can keep me covered down at the tavern.' Lansdale nodded. "'Well, how are things going, then?' First of all, the brewery,' Cardin began. Lansdale consigned the brewery to perdition. "'That's just your cover. Any money it makes is purely irrelevant. How about the election?' "'Pelton's in,' Cardin said. "'As nearly in as any candidate ever was before the polls opened. Three months ago the independents were as solid as Gibraltar used to be. Today they look like Gibraltar after the H-bomb hit it. The only difference is they don't know what hit them yet.' "'Hamilton's campaign manager does.' Lansdale said. Did you hear his telecast this morning? Cardin shook his head. Lansdale handed over a little half-inch, thirty-minute record disc. All you need is the first three or four minutes, he said. The rest of it is repetition. Cardin put the disc in his pocket recorder and set it for playback, putting the plug in his ear. After a while, he shut it off and took out the earplug. That's bad. What are we going to do about it? Lansdale shrugged. What are you going to do? he countered. You're Pelton's campaign manager. Heaven pity him. Cardin thought for a moment. We'll play it for laughs, he decided. Some of our semantics experts could make the joke of the year out of it by the time the polls open tomorrow. The fraternity's bribing their worst enemy to attack them so that he can ruin their business. Who's been listening to a tape of Alice in Wonderland at independent conservative headquarters? That would work, Lansdale agreed, and we can count on our friends Joyner and Graves to give you every possible assistance with their customary bull-in-a-china shop tactics. I suppose you've seen these posters they've been plastering around. If you can read this, Chester Pelton is your sworn enemy. A vote for Pelton is a vote for your own enslavement. <laughs> Naturally. And have you seen the telecast we've been using? A view of it, with a semantically correct spoken paraphrase? Lansdale nodded. And I've also noticed that those posters have been acquiring different obscene crayon drawings, too. That's just typical of the short-range Joyner Graves mentality. Why, they've made more votes for Pelton than he's made for himself. Is it any wonder we're convinced that people like that aren't to be trusted to formulate the future policy of the fraternities? Well, they've proved themselves wrong. I wonder, though, if we can prove ourselves right in the long run. There are times when this thing scares me, Chief. If anything went wrong, what, for instance? Somebody could get to Pelton. Cardin made a stabbing gesture with the stiletto, which he still held. Maybe you don't really know how hot this thing's gotten. What we had to cut out of Mongery's report this morning. Oh, I've been keeping in touch, Lansdale understated gently. Well, then, if anything happened to Pelton, there wouldn't be a literate left alive in this city twelve hours later. And I question whether or not Graves and Joyner know that. I think they do. If they don't, it's not because I've failed to point it out to them. Of course, there are the independent conservative grafters. A lot of them are beginning to hear jail doors opening for them, and they're scared. But I think routine bodyguarding ought to protect Pelton from them, or from any isolated fanatics. And there is also the matter of Pelton's daughter, and his son, Cardin said. We know, and Graves and Joyner know, and I assume that Slade Gardner knows, that they can both read and write as well as any literate in the fraternities. Suppose that got out between now and the election. And that could not only hurt Pelton, but it would expose the work we've been doing in the schools, Lansdale added. And even inside the fraternities, that would raise the devil. Joyner and Graves don't begin to realize how far we've gone with that. They could kick up a simply hideous row about it. And if Pelton found out that his kids are literates, woof, Corden grimaced, or what we've been doing to them, I hope I'm not around when that happens. I'm beginning to like the cantankerous old bugger. I was afraid of that, Lansdale said. Well, don't let it interfere with what you have to do. Remember, Frank, the plan has to come first. Always. He walked with O'Reilly to the street door, talking about tomorrow's election. After shaking hands with the saloon-keeper, he crossed the sidewalk and stepped onto the beltway, 
moving across the strips until he came to the twenty miles per hour strip. The tall office buildings of Upper Yonkers Borough marched away as he stood on the strip, appreciatively puffing at Lansdale's cigar. The character of the street changed, the buildings grew lower, and the quiet and fashionable ground-floor shops and cafes gave place to bargain stores, their audio advertisers whooping urgently about improbable prices and offerings, and garish, noisy, crowded bars and cafeterias blaring recorded popular music. There was quite a bit of political advertising in evidence, huge pictures of the two major senatorial candidates. He estimated that Chester Pelton's bald head and bulldog features appeared twice for every one of Grant Hamilton's white locks, old-fashioned spectacles, and self-satisfied smirk. Then he came to the building on which he had parked his copter and left the beltway, entering and riding up to the landing stage on the helical escalator. There seemed to have been some trouble. About a dozen independent conservative stormtroopers in their white robes and hoods, with the fiery cross emblem on their breasts, were bunched together, most of them with their right hands inside their bosoms, while a similar group of radical conservative stormtroopers, with their black sombreros and little black masks, stood watching them and fingering the white-handled pistols they wore in pairs on their belts. Between the two groups were four city policemen, looking acutely unhappy. The group in the Lone Ranger uniforms, he saw, were standing in front of a huge tridimensional animated portrait of Chester Pelton. As he watched, the pictured candidate raised a clenched fist, and Pelton's recorded and amplified voice thundered, "'Put the literates in their place. Our servants, not our masters.' He recognized the group leader of the radical socialists. The masks were too small to be more than token disguises, and beckoned to him, at the same time walking toward his copter. The man in black with the white-handled pistols followed him, spurs jingling. "'Hello, Mr. Cardin,' he said, joining him. "'Nothing to it. We got a tip they were coming to sabotage Big Brother over there. Take out our sound recording and put in one of their own, like they did over in Queens last week. The town clowns got here in time to save everybody's face, so there wasn't any shooting. We're staying put till they go, though.' "'Put the literates in their place. Our servants, not our masters.' The huge tridianimate bellowed. Over in Queens, the independents had managed to get at a similar tridianimate, had taken out the record, and had put in one. I am a lying fraud. Vote for Grant Hamilton and liberty and sound judgment. Smart work, Goodkin, he approved. Don't let any of your boys start the gunplay. The city cops are beginning to get wise to who's going to win the election tomorrow, but don't antagonize them. If any of those Ku Kluxers tries to pull a gun, don't waste time trying to wing him. Just hold on to that fiery something or other on his chest, and let him have it, and let the coroner worry about him. Yeah, with pleasure, Goodkin replied. You know, that nightshirt thing they wear is about the stupidest idea for a stormtroop uniform I ever saw. Natural target in a gunfight, and in a rough and tumble it gets them all tangled up. Ah, there go a couple of coppers to talk to them. That's what they've been waiting on. Now they can beat it without looking like they've been run out by our gang. Cardin nodded. Tell your boys to stay around for a while. They may expect you to leave right after they do, and then they'll try to slip back. You did a good job. Got here promptly. Be seeing you, Goodkin. He climbed into his own copter and started the motor. Put the literates in their place. The tridimensional colossus roared triumphantly after the retreating independents. Our servants, not our masters. At eight thousand, he got the copter onto the lower Manhattan beam and relaxed. First of all, he'd have to do something about answering Slade Gardner's telecast propaganda. That stuff was dangerous. The answer ought to go on the air by noon and should be stepped up through the afternoon. First, as a straight news story. Elliot Mongery had fifteen minutes, beginning at twelve-fifteen. No, that wouldn't do. Mongery's sponsor for that time was Adam Flame Heaters, and Adam Flame was a subsidiary of Canada Northwest Fissionables, and Canada Northwest was umbilicus deep in that Kettle River lease graft that Pelton had sworn to get investigated as soon as he took office. Professional ethics wouldn't allow Mongery to say anything in Pelton's behalf on Adam Flame's time. Well... There was Guthrie Parham, and he came on at 12.45, and his sponsor was all right. He'd call Parham and tell him what he wanted done. The buzzer warned him that he was approaching the lower Manhattan beacon. He shifted to manual control, 
dropped down to the three thousand foot level and set his selector beam for the signal from pelton's purchaser's paradise down toward the tip of the island in the section that had been rebuilt after that stalin and mark fifteen guided missile had gotten through the counter rocket defenses in nineteen eighty seven he could see the quadrate cross of his goal with public landing stages on each of the four arms and the higher central block with its landing stage for freight and store personnel above the four public stages helicopters swarmed like mayflies mayflies which had mutated and invented ritual or military drill or choreography coming in four streams to the tip of the arms and rising vertically from the middle there was about ten times the normal amount of traffic for this early in the morning he wondered briefly then remembered and cursed that infernal sail grudgingly he respected russell latterman's smartness and in consequence the ability of wilton joyner and harvey graves in selecting a good agent to plant in pelton's store letterman gave a plausible impersonation of the illiterate businessman loyal prime minister of pelton's commercial empire generalissimo in the perpetual war against macy and gimbals from that viewpoint the sale was excellent business latterman had gotten the jump on all the other department stores for the winter fashions and fall sports trade he had also turned the store into a madhouse at the exact time when chester pelton needed to give all his attention to the election pressing the button that put on his private recognition signal he rose above the incoming customers and began to drop toward the private landing stage circling to get a view of the other four stages maybe the sale could be turned to some advantage at that a free souvenir with each purchase carrying a pelton for senator picture message he broke off peering down at the five hundred foot square landing stage above the central block then brought his copter swooping down rapidly the white-clad figures he had seen swarming up the helical escalator were not wearing the ku klux robes of the independent conservative storm troops as he had first feared they were in literate smocks and among them were the black leather jackets and futuristic helmets of their guards they were led he saw by stephen s bain the store's chief literate with him were his assistant literate third class roger b feinberg and the novices carrying books and briefcases and cased typewriters and the guards and every literate employed in the store four or five men in ordinary vivid colored business suits were obviously expostulating about something as he landed and threw back the transparent canopy he could hear a babble of voices above which feinberg was crying unfair 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 to organized literacy he jumped out and hurried over but you simply can't a white-haired man in blue and orange business clothes was protesting if you do the associated fraternities will be liable for losses we incur you know that bain his thin face livid with anger and also carton noticed with what looked like a couple of fresh bruises ignored him feinberg broke off his chant of unfair unfair long enough to answer a literate first class has been brutally assaulted by the illiterate owner of this store literate service for this store is accordingly being discontinued pending a decision by the grand council of the local fraternity cardin grabbed the blue and orange clad man and dragged him to one side what happened hutchnecker he demanded they're walking out on us hutchnecker told him unnecessarily the boss had a fight with bain knocked him down a couple of times bain tried to pull his tablet gun and i grabbed it away from him and somebody else grabbed pelton before he could pull his and a couple of store cops got all the other literates in the office covered then bain put on the general address system and began calling out the literates yes but why did pelton beat bain up bain made a pass at miss claire i wasn't there when it happened she came into the office cardin felt his face tighten to a frown of perplexity that wasn't like literate first class stephen s bain he made quite a hobby of pinching sales girls behind the counter which was one thing the boss's daughter was quite another where's latterman he asked looking around down in the office with the others trying to help mr pelton he's had another of those heart attacks cardin swore and ran for the descending escalator running down the rotating spiral to the executive floor and jumping off into the gawking mob of illiterate clerks crowded in the open doors of pelton's office he hit and shoved and elbowed and cursed them out of the way and burst into the big room beyond and then for a moment he was almost sorry he had come 
Pelton was slumped in his big relaxer chair, his face pale and twisted in pain, his breath coming in feeble gasps. His daughter was beside him, her blonde head bent over him. Russell Latterman was standing to one side, watching intently. For an instant, Cardin was reminded of a tomcat watching a promising mouse hole. Claire! Cardin exploded. Give him a nitrocaine bulb. Why are you all just standing around? Claire turned. There are none, she said, looking at him with desperate eyes. The box is empty. He must have used them all. He shot a quick glance at Ladderman, catching the sales manager before he could erase a look of triumph from his face. Things began to add up. Ladderman, of course, was the undercover man for Wilton Joyner and Harvey Graves and the rest of the conservative faction at Literates Hall, just as he himself was Lansdale's agent. Obsessed with immediate advantages and disadvantages, the Joyner Graves faction wanted to secure the re-election of Grant Hamilton, and the way things had been going in the past two months, only Chester Pelton's death could accomplish that. Latterman had probably thrown out Pelton's nitrocaine capsules and then put Bain up to insulting Pelton's daughter, knowing that a fit of rage would bring on another heart attack, which could be fatal without the medicine. We'll send for more. The prescription's in the safe, she said faintly. The office safe was locked, and only a literate could open it. The double combination was neatly stenciled on the door, the numbers spelled out as words and the letters spelled in phonetic equivalents. All three of them, himself, Claire, and Russell Latterman, could read them. None of them dared admit it. Latterman was fairly licking his chops in anticipation. If Cardin opened the safe, Pelton's campaign manager stood convicted as illiterate. If Claire opened it, the gaggle of illiterate clerks in the doorway would see and speedily spread the news that the daughter of the arch-foe of literacy was herself able to read. Maybe Latterman hadn't really intended his employer to die. Maybe this was the situation he had really intended to contrive. Chester Pelton couldn't be allowed to die. If Grant Hamilton were returned to the Senate, the long-range planning of William Lansdale would suffer a crushing setback, and the public reaction would be catastrophic. The plan comes first, Lansdale had told him. He made his decision, and then saw that he hadn't needed to make it. Claire had straightened, left her father, crossed quickly to the safe, and was kneeling in front of it, her back stiff with determination, her fingers busy at the dials, her eyes going from them to the printed combination and back again. She swung open the door, skimmed through the papers inside, unerringly selected the prescription, and rose. "'Here, Russ, go get it filled at once,' she ordered, "'and hurry!' "'Oh, no, you don't,' Cardin thought. "'One chance is enough for you, Russ.' He snatched the prescription from her and turned to Ladderman. "'I'll get it,' he told the sales manager. "'You're needed for the sale. Stay on the job here.' "'But with the literates walked out, we can't—' Cardin blazed. "'Do I have to teach you your business? Have a sample of each item set aside at the counter and pile sales slips under it. And for unique items, just detach the tag and put it with the sales slip. Now get out of here and get cracking with it.' He picked up the pistol that had been taken from Pelton when he had tried to draw it on Bain, checking the chamber and setting the safety. "'Know how to use this?' he asked Claire. "'Then hang on to it and stay close to your father. This wasn't any accident. It was a deliberate attempt on his life. I'll have a couple of store cops sent in here. See that they stay with you.' He gave her no chance to argue. Pushing Ladderman ahead of him, he drove through the mob of clerks outside the door. "'Course she can. Didn't you see her open the safe?' he heard. Nobody but illiterate. Then she's illiterate herself. A couple of centuries ago, they would have talked like that if it had been discovered that the girl were pregnant. A couple of centuries before that, they would have been equally horrified if she had been discovered to have been a Protestant, or a Catholic, or whatever the locally unpopular religion happened to be. By noon, this would be all over Penn, Jersey, York, coming on top of Slade Gardner's accusations. He ran up the spiral escalator, stumbling and regaining his footing as he left it. Bain and his striking literates were all gone. He saw a sergeant of Pelton's store police and went toward him, taking his spare identity badge from his pocket. Here, he said, handing it to the sergeant, get another officer and go down to Pelton's office. Show it to Miss Pelton and tell her I sent you. There's been an attempt on Chester Pelton's life. You're to stay with him. 
Use your own judgment, but don't let anybody, and that definitely includes Russell Latterman, get at him. If you see anything suspicious, shoot first and ask questions afterwards. What's your name, Sergeant? Cocazello, sir. Guido Cocazello. All right. There'll be a medic or a pharmacist. A literate, anyhow, with medicine for Mr. Pelton. He'll ask for you, by name, and mention me. And there'll be another literate, maybe. He'll know your name and use mine. Hurry now, Sergeant. He jumped into his copter, pulled forward the plexiglass canopy, and took off vertically to ten thousand feet, then, orienting himself, swooped downward toward a landing stage on the other side of the East River, cutting across traffic levels with an utter contempt for regulations. The building on which he landed was one of the principal pharmacies. He spiraled down on the escalator to the main floor and went directly to the literate in charge, noticing that he wore on his Sam Brown not only the badges of retail merchandising, pharmacist, and graduate chemist, but also that of medic in training. Snatching a pad and pencil from a counter, he wrote hastily, Your private office at once, urgent and important. Looking at it, the literate nodded in recognition of Cardin's literacy. Over this way, sir, he said, guiding Cardin to a small cubicle office. Here, Cardin gave him the prescription. Nitrocaine bulbs. They're for Chester Pelton. He's had a serious heart attack. He needs these with all speed. I don't suppose I need to tell you how many kinds of hell will break loose if he dies now, and the fraternities are accused, as the illiterates' organization will be sure to, of having had him poisoned. Who are you? the literate asked, taking the prescription and glancing at it. That, he gestured toward Cardin's silver-laced black Mexican jacket, isn't exactly a white smock. Cardin had his pocket recorder in his hand. He held it out, pressing a concealed stud. The stylus and tablet insignia glowed redly on it for a moment, then vanished. The uniformed literate nodded. Fill this exactly. Better do it yourself to make sure, and take it over to Pelton's yourself. I see you have a medic trainee's badge. Ask for Sergeant Cocozello and tell him Frank Cardin sent you. The literate, who had not recognized him before, opened his eyes at the name and whistled softly. And fix up a sedative to keep him quiet for not less than four, nor more than six, hours. Let me use your visiphone for a while, if you please. The man in the literate smock nodded and hurried out. Cardin dialed William R. Lansdale's private number. When Lansdale's thin, intense face appeared on the screen, he reported swiftly. The way I estimate it, he finished, Latterman put Bain up to making a pass at the girl after having thrown out Pelton's nitrocaine bulbs, probably told the silly jerk that Claire was pining away with secret passion for him or something. Maybe he wanted to kill Pelton. Maybe he just wanted this to happen. I assume there's no chance of stopping a leak? Cardin laughed with mirthless harshness. That, I take it, was rhetorical. Yes, of course. Lansdale's face assumed the blank expression that went with a pause for semantic reintegration. Can you cover yourself for about an hour? Certainly. Copter trouble. Visits to campaign headquarters. An appeal on Pelton's behalf for a new crew of literates for the store. Good enough. Come over. I think I can see a way to turn this to advantage. I'm going to call for an emergency session of the Grand Council this afternoon, and I want you sitting in on it. I want to talk to you about plans now. He considered for a moment. There's too much of a crowd at O'Reilly's now. Come the church way. Breaking the connection, Cardin dialed again. A girl's face, over a literate third-class smock, appeared in the screen. A lovely golden voice chimed at him. Mineola High School. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Frank Cardin here. Let me talk at once to your principal, literate first-class Prestonby. End of section two. Section three of Null ABC by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karina Schultz. Ralph Prestonby cleared his throat, slipped a master disc into the recording machine beside his desk, and pressed the start button. Dear parent or guardian, he began, your daughter, now a third-year student at this school, has reached the age of eligibility for the domestic science course entitled How to Win and Hold a Husband. 
statistics show that girls who have completed this valuable course are sooner longer and happier married than those who have not enjoyed its advantages we recommend it most highly however because of the delicate nature of some of the visual material used your consent is required you can attach such consent to this disc by running it for at least ten seconds after the sign-off and then switching from play to transcribe kindly include your full name as well as your daughter's and place your thumbprint on the opposite side of the disc very sincerely yours literate first class ralph c prestonby principal he put the master disc in an envelope checked over a list of names and addresses of parents and girl students and put that in also he looked over the winter sport schedule and signed and thumb printed it then he loaded the recorder with his morning's mail switched to play and started it as he listened he blew smoke rings across the room and toyed with a dagger made from a file which had been thrown down the central light well at him a few days before the invention of the pocket recorder which put a half hour's conversation on a half-inch disc had done more to slow down business and promote inane correspondence than anything since the earlier inventions of shorthand typewriters and pretty stenographers finally he cleared the machine dumping the whole mess into a basket and carrying it out to his secretary miss collins take this infernal rubbish and have a couple of the girls divide it between them play it off and make a digest of it he said and here the sports schedule and this parental consent thing on the husband trapping course have them taken care of this stuff martha collins said poking at the pile of letter discs i suppose about half of it is threats abuse and obscenities and the other half is from long-winded bores with idiotic suggestions and ill-natured gripes i'll use that old tagline again hoping you appreciate our brevity as much as we enjoyed yours yes that'll be all right he looked at his watch i'm going to make a personal building tour instead of using the tv the animals are sort of restless today the election the infantile compulsion to take sides if you need me for anything urgent don't use oral call just flash my signal red blue red blue on the hall and classroom screens oh doug yetsko his length of rubber hose under his arm ambled out of prestonby's private office stopping to stub out his cigarette the action reminded prestonby that he still had his pipe in his mouth he knocked it out and pocketed it together they went into the hall outside where to first captain yetsko wanted to know cloak and dagger department on the top floor then we'll drop down to the shops and then up through domestic science and business and general arts and back here we hope yetsko finished they took a service elevator to the top floor emerging into a stockroom piled with boxes and crates and cases of sound records and cans of film and stacks of picture cards and all the other impedimenta of illiterate education passing through it to the other end prestonby unlocked a door and they went down a short hall to where ten or fifteen boys and girls had just gotten off a helical escalator and were queued up at a door at the other end there were two literate guards in black leather and a student monitor with his white belt and rubber truncheon outside the door prestonby swore under his breath he'd hoped they'd miss this but since they hadn't there was nothing for it but to fall in at the tail of the queue one by one the boys and girls went up spoke briefly to the guards and the student monitor and were passed through the door each time one of the guards had to open it with a key finally it was prestonby's turn b d f h j l n p r t v x y he recited to the guardians of the door a c e g i k m o q s u w y the monitor replied solemnly the inkwell is dry and the book is dusty but tomorrow there will be writing and reading for all prestonby answered the guard with the key unlocked the door and he and yetsko went through into an utterly silent soundproofed room and from it into an inner noisy room where a recorded voice was chanting 
hat a t h a t box b o x b o x gun g a n g u n girl g a l while pictures were flashed on a screen at the front and words appeared under them there were about twenty boys and girls of the freshman year age bracket at desk seats facing the screen they'd started learning the alphabet when school had opened in september now they had gotten as far as combining letters into simple words in another month they'd be as far as diphthongs and would be initiated into the mysteries of silent letters maybe sooner than that he was finding that children who had not been taught to read until their twelfth year learned much more rapidly than the primary grade children in the literate schools what he was doing here wasn't exactly illegal it wasn't even against the strict letter of fraternity regulations but it had to be done clandestinely what he'd have liked to have done would have been to have given every boy and girl in english one the same instruction this selected group was getting but that would have been out of the question the public would never have stood for it the police would have had to intervene to prevent a riotous mob of illiterates from tearing the school down brick by brick and even if that didn't happen the ensuing uproar inside the fraternity would have blown the roof off literates hall even lansdale couldn't have survived such an explosion and the body of literate first-class ralph n prestonby would have been found in a vacant lot the next morning even many of lansdale's supporters would have turned on him in anger at this sudden blow to the fraternity's monopoly of the printed word so it had to be kept secret and since adolescents in possession of a secret are under constant temptation to hint mysteriously in the presence of outsiders this hocus-pocus of ritual and password and countersign had to be resorted to he'd been in conspiratorial work of other kinds and knew that there was a sound psychological basis for most of what seemed at first glance to be mere melodramatic claptrap he and yetsko passed on through a door across the room into another soundproofed room the work of soundproofing and partitioning the old stockroom had been done in the last semester of his first year at mineola high by members of the graduating class of building trade students who had then gone their several ways convinced that they had been working on a set of music class practice rooms the board of education had never even found out about it in this second room a literate teacher one of the lansdale faction had a reading class of twenty-five or thirty a girl was on her feet with a book in her hand reading from it we are not sure of sorrow and joy was never sure Today will die tomorrow. Time stoops to no man's lure. And love, grown faint and fretful, with lips but half regretful, sighs, and with eyes forgetful, weeps that no loves endure. Then she handed the book, it was the only copy, to the boy sitting in front of her, and he rose to read the next verse. Prestonby, catching the teacher's eye, nodded and smiled. This was a third-year class, of course, but from H-A-T spells hat to Swinburne in three years was good work. There were three other classes, a total of little over a hundred students. There was no trouble. They were there for one purpose only, to learn. He spoke with one of the teachers, whose class was busy with a written exercise, he talked for a while to another whose only duty at the moment was to answer questions and furnish help to a small class who were reading silently from a variety of smuggled-in volumes only a hundred and twenty out of five thousand yetsko said to him as they were dropping down in the elevator by which they had come think you'll ever really get anything done with them i won't maybe they won't he replied but the ones they'll teach will they're just a cadre it'll take fifty years before the effects are really felt but some day the shops a good half of the school was trades training were noisy and busy 
Here Prestonby kept his hand on his gas projector, and Yetzko had his rubber hose ready, either to strike or to discard in favor of his pistol. The instructors were similarly on the alert and ready for trouble. He had seen penitentiaries where the guards took it easier. Carpentry and building trades, machine shop, welding, copter and TV repair shops. He made a minor and relatively honest graft there, from the sale of rebuilt equipment. Even an atomic equipment shop, though there was nothing in the place that would excite a Geiger more than the instructor's luminous dial watch. Domestic science, home decorating, home handicrafts, use of home appliances, beautician school, charm school. He and Yetzko sampled the products of the cooking school, intended for the cafeteria, and found them edible, if uninspired. Business. Classes in recording letters, using illiterate business machines, preparing illiterate cards for same, filing recordings. Always with the counsel. When in doubt, consult a literate. General arts. Spanish and French, from elaborate record players, the progeny of the old twentieth-century linguophone. English, with recorded speech composition, enunciation training, semantics, and what Prestonby called English illiterature. The class he visited was drowsing through one of the less colorful sections of Gone with the Wind. World history, with half the students frankly asleep through an audiovisual on the feudal system, with planted hints on how nice a revival of the same would be, and identifying the clergy of the Middle Ages with the fraternities of literates. American history, with the class wide awake, since Custer's massacre was obviously only moments away. "'Wanna bet one of those little cherubs doesn't try to scalp another before the day's out?' Yetzko whispered. Prestonby shook his head. <laughs> "'No bet. Remember that film on the Spanish Inquisition that we had to discontinue?' It was then that the light on the classroom screen, which had been flickering green and white, suddenly began flashing Prestonby's wanted-at-office signal. Prestonby found Frank Carden looking out of the screen in his private office. The round, ordinarily cheerful face was serious, but the innocent blue eyes were as unreadable as ever. He was wearing one of the new Mexican chotteral style jackets, black laced with silver. "'I can't see all your office, Ralph,' he said as Prestonby approached. "'Are you alone?' "'Doug Yetz goes all,' Prestonby said, and, as Cardin hesitated, added, "'Don't be silly, Frank. He's my bodyguard. What could I be in that he wouldn't know all about?' Cardin nodded. "'Well, we're in a jam up to here.' A hand wave conveyed the impression that the sea of troubles had risen to his chin. He spoke at some length describing the fight between Chester Pelton and Stephen S. Bain, the literate strike at Pelton's purchaser's paradise, Pelton's heart attack, and the circumstances of Clare's opening the safe. "'So you see,' he finished, "'maybe Latterman tried to kill Pelton. Maybe he just tried to do what he did. I can't take chances either way.' Prestonby thought furiously. "'You say Clare's alone at the store with her father?' and a couple of store cops, sterling characters with the hearts of lions and the brains of goldfish, Cardin replied, and Russ Latterman, and maybe four or five conservative goons he's managed to infiltrate into the store. Prestonby was still thinking, aloud now. Maybe they did mean to kill Pelton. In that case, they'll try again. Or maybe they only wanted to expose Claire's literacy. It's hard to say what else they'd try. Maybe kidnap her? To truth-drug her and use her as a guest artist on a conservative telecast? I'm going over to the store now. That's a good idea, Ralph. If you hadn't thought of it, I was going to suggest it. Land on the central stage, ask for Sergeant Cocozello of the store police, and give my name. Even aside from everything else, it'd be a good idea to have somebody there who can read and dares admit it, till a new crew of literates can get there. You were speaking about the possibility of kidnapping. How about the boy, Ray? Prestonby nodded. I'll have him come here to my office and stay there till I get back. I'll have Yetzko stay with him. He turned to where the big man in black leather stood guard at the door. Doug, go get Ray Pelton and bring him here. Check with Miss Collins for where he'd be now. 
he turned back to the screen. Anything else, Frank? Isn't that enough? the brewer literate demanded. I'll call you at the store after a while. Bye. The screen darkened as Cardin broke the connection. Preston begot to his feet, went to his desk, and picked up a pipe, digging out the ashes from the bowl with an ice pick that one of the teachers had taken from a sixteen-year-old would-be murderer. He checked his tablet gun, made sure that there was an extra loaded clip in the holster, and got two more spare clips from the arms locker. Then, to make sure, he called Pelton's store, talking for a while to the police sergeant Cardin had mentioned. By the time he was finished, the door opened and Yetsko ushered Ray Pelton in. "'What happened?' the boy asked. "'Doug told me that the senator, my father, had another heart attack.' "'Yes, Ray. I don't believe he's in any great danger. He's at the store, resting in his office.' He went on to tell the boy what had happened, exactly and in full detail. He was only fifteen, but already he had completed the four-year reading course, and he could think a great deal more logically than seventy per cent of the people who were legally entitled to vote. Ray listened seriously, and proved Preston B.'s confidence justified by nodding. "'Frame up,' he said succinctly. "'Stinks like a glue factory of a put-up job. Something's going to happen to Russ Latterman one of these days.' "'I think you'd better let Frank Cardin take care of him, Ray,' Preston B. advised. "'I think there are more angles to this than he told me. "'Now, I'm going over to the store. "'Somebody's got to stay with Claire. "'I want you to stay here, in this room. "'If anybody sends you any message, supposed to be from me, "'just ignore it. It'll be a trap. "'If I want to get in touch with you, I'll call you, with vision image. "'Mean somebody might try to kidnap me, or Claire, "'to force the senator to withdraw or something?' Ray asked, his eyes widening. "'You catch on quickly, Ray,' Preston B. commended him. "'Doug, you stay with Ray till I get back. Don't let him out of your sight for an instant. At noon, have Miss Collins get lunches for both of you sent up. If I'm not back by 1500, take him to his home and stay with him there.' For half an hour, Frank Cardin made a flying tour of Radical Socialist Borough Headquarters, even at the Manhattan headquarters, which he visited immediately after his talk with Prestonby, the news had already gotten out. The atmosphere of optimistic triumph, which had undoubtedly followed Mongery's telecast and his report on the Trotter Pole, had evaporated. The literate clerical help was gathered in a tight knot, obviously a little worried, and just as obviously enjoying the reaction. In smaller and constantly changing groups, the volunteers, the paid helpers, the dirt squirters, the goon gangs, gathered, talking in worried or frightened or angry voices. When Cardin entered and was recognized, there was a concerted movement toward him. His two regular bodyguards, both on leave from the literate storm troops, moved quickly to range themselves on either side of him. With a gesture, he halted the others. "'Hold it,' he called. "'I know what you're worried about. I was there when it happened and saw everything.' He paused to let them assimilate that, and continued. Now get this, all of you. Our boss, and, if he lives, our next senator, was the victim of a deliberate murder attempt by literate first-class Bane, who threw out his supply of nitrocaine bulbs and then goaded him into a heart attack which, except for his daughter, would have been fatal. Claire Pelton deserves the deepest gratitude of every radical socialist in the state. She's a smart girl, and she saved the life of her father and our leader. But she is not illiterate he cried loudly. All she did was something any of you could have done, something I've done myself, so that I won't be locked out of my own safe and have to wait for a literate to come and open it for me. She simply kept her eye on the literates who were opening the safe, and learned the combination from the positions to which they turned the dial. And you believe, on the strength of that, that she's illiterate? The next thing, you'll be believing that professional liar of a slayed gardener, and you call yourselves politicians." He fairly gargled obscenities. Looking around, he caught sight of a pair who seemed something less than impressed with his account of it. Joe West, thick-armed, hairy-chested, blue-jowled, Horace Yingling, thin and gangling. They weren't radical socialist party people. They were from the political action committee of the Consolidated Illiterates Organization, and their slogan was simpler and more to the point than Chester Pelton's. The only good literate is a dead literate. He tensed himself and challenged them directly. Joe, Horace, 
How about you? Satisfied the Pelton girl isn't illiterate now? Yingling looked at West, and West looked back at him questioningly. Evidently, the suavitor in Mundo was Yingling's province, and the fortier in Re was West's. Yeah, sure, Mr. Carden, Yingling said dubiously. Now that you explain it, we see how it was. It was worse than that in some of the other boroughs. One fanatic, imagining that Carden himself was a crypto-literate, drew a gun. Carden's guards disarmed him and beat him senseless. At another headquarters, some character was circulating about declaring that not only Claire Pelton, but her younger brother Ray, as well, were literates. Carden's two men hustled him out of the building, and, after about twenty minutes, returned alone. Carden hoped that the body would not be found until after the polls closed the next day. Finally, leaving his guards with the copter at a public landing stage, he made his way, by devious routes, to William R. Lansdale's office, and found Lansdale at his desk, seeming not to have moved since he had showed his agent out earlier in the day. "'Well, we're in a nice puddle of something or other,' Carden greeted him, "'on top of that Gardner telecast this morning. "'Guthrie Parham's taking care of that, and everything's going to be done to ridicule Gardner,' Lansdale told him and even this business at the store can be turned to some advantage. Before we're through, we may gain more votes than we lose for Pelton. And we had an informal meeting, Joiner for retail merchandising, Stark for grievance settlements, and four or five others, including myself, to make up a quorum. We had Bain in and heard his story of it, and we got a report from one of our stoolies in the store. Bain thought he was due for a commendation. Instead, he got an eat-out, of course, it was a fact that Pelton hid him, and we can't have literates punched round regardless of provocation. So we voted to fine Pelton ten million for beating Bain up, and to award him ten million for losses resulting from unauthorized withdrawal of literate services. We ordered a new crew of literates to the store, and we exiled Bain to Brooklyn, to something called Stillman's Used Copter and Junk Bazaar. For the next few months— the only thing he'll find that's round and pinchable will be second-hand tires. But don't be too hard on him. I think he did us a favor. You mean starting a rift between Pelton and the Consolidated Illiterates Organization, which we can widen after the election? No, I hadn't thought of it that way, Frank, Lansdale smiled. It's an idea worth keeping in mind, and we'll exploit it later. What I was thinking about was the more immediate problem of the election— the buzzer on Lansdale's desk interrupted, and a voice came out of the commo box. Message, urgent and private, sir. Source named as Sforza. Cardin recognized the name. Maybe the independent conservatives have troubles, too, he thought hopefully. Then Lansdale's video screen became the frame for an almost unbelievably commonplace set of features. Sforza, sir, the man in the screen said. Sorry I'm late, but I was able to get out of the building only a few minutes ago, and I had to make sure I wasn't wearing a tail. I have two new facts. First, the conservatives have been bringing storm troops in from outside, from Philadelphia, and from Wilkes Scranton, and from Buffalo. They are being concentrated in lower Manhattan, in plain clothes, with only concealed weapons, and carrying their hoods folded up under their coats. Second, I overheard a few snatches of conversation between two of the conservative stormtroop leaders, as follows. Start it in China, 1330, and important to make it appear either spontaneous or planned for business motives. Try to get us more information as quickly as possible, Lansdale directed. Obviously we should know, by about 1300, what's being planned. Right, sir. Lansdale's spy at Independent Conservative Headquarters nodded and vanished from the screen. "'What does it sound like to you, Frank?' Lansdale asked. "'China is obviously a code designation for some place in downtown Manhattan, where the conservative goon gangs are being concentrated. The only thing I can say is that it probably is not Chinatown. They'd either say Chinatown and not China, or they would use some code designation that wasn't so close to the actual name.' Cardin considered. What they're going to start at 1330, which is only two and a half hours from now, is probably some kind of riot. A riot which could arise from business motives, Lansdale added. That sounds like the docks, or the wholesale district, or the garment district, or something like that. 
He passed his hand rapidly over the photoelectric eye of the commo box. Get me Major Slater, he said. And a little later, Major, get a platoon out to Long Island, to Chester Pelton's home. Have the place searched for possible booby traps, and maintain guard there till further notice. You'll have no trouble with the servants. They're all in our pay. That platoon must not, repeat, not, wear uniform or appear to have any connection with the fraternities. Put another platoon in Pelton's store, concealed weapons and plain clothes. They should carry their leather helmets and shopping bags and roam about in the store, ostensibly shopping. And a full company, uniformed and armed with heavy weapons, alerted and ready for immediate copter movement. He went on to explain about the intelligence report and the conclusions drawn from it. The guard's officer repeated back his instructions, and Lansdale broke the connection. "'Now, Frank,' he said, "'I told you that this revelation of Claire Pelton's literacy can be turned to our advantage. There's to be a full council meeting at 1300. Here's what I estimate Joyner and Graves will try to do, and here's what I'm going to do to counter it.' A couple of men in the maroon uniforms of Pelton's store police were waiting as Prestonby's copter landed on the top stage. One of them touched his cap visor with his gas billy in salute, and said, "'Literate Prestonby, Miss Pelton is expecting you. She's in her father's office. This way, if you please, sir.' He had hoped to find her alone, but when he entered the office he saw five or six of the store personnel with her. Since opening her father's safe— she had evidently dropped all pretense of illiteracy. There was a mass of papers spread on the big desk, and she was referring from one to another of them with the deft skill of a regular fraternity's literate, while the others watched in fascinated horror. "'Wait a moment, Mr. Hutchnecker,' she told the white-haired man in the blue and orange business suit with whom she had been talking, and laid the printed price schedule down, advancing to meet him. "'Ralph!' she greeted him. Frank Carden told me you were coming. I... For a moment he thought of the afternoon, over two years ago, when she had entered his office at the school and he had recognized her as the older sister of young Ray Pelton. Professor Prestonby, she had begun accusingly, you have been teaching my brother, Raymond Pelton, to read. He had been prepared for that, had known that, sooner or later, there would be some minor leak in the security screen around the classrooms on the top floor. "'My dear Miss Pelton,' he had protested pleasantly, "'I think you've become overwrought over nothing. This pretense to literacy is a phase most boys of Ray's age pass through. They do it just as they play air pirates or hijackers a few years earlier. The usual trick is to memorize something heard from a record disc and then pretend to read it from print.' Don't try to kid me, Professor. I know that Ray can read. I can prove it. And supposing he has learned a few words, he had parried. Can you be sure I taught him? And if so, what had you thought of doing about it? Are you going to expose me as a corrupter of youth? Not unless I have to, she had replied coolly. I'm going to blackmail you, Professor. I want you to teach me to read, too. Now... With this gang of her father's illiterate store officials present, a quick handclasp and a glance were all they could exchange. "'How is he, Claire?' he asked. "'Out of danger, for the present. There was a medic here who left just before you arrived. He brought nitrocaine bulbs and gave father something to make him sleep. He's lying down, back in his rest room.' She led him to a door at the rear of the office and motioned him to enter, following him. "'He's going to sleep for a couple of hours yet.' The room was a sort of bedroom and dressing room, with a minuscule toilet and shower beyond. Pelton was lying on his back, sleeping. His face was pale, but he was breathing easily and regularly. Two of the store policemen, a sergeant and a patrolman, were playing cards on the little table, and the patrolman had a burp gun within reach. "'All right, sergeant,' Claire said. "'You and Gorman go out to the office. Call me if anything comes up that needs my attention in the next few minutes.' The sergeant started to protest. Claire cut him off. "'There's no danger here. This literate can be trusted. He's a friend of Mr. Carden's. Works at the brewery. It's all right.' The two rose and went out, leaving the door barely ajar. Prestonby and Claire, like a pair of marionettes on the same set of strings, cast a quick glance at the door, 
and then were in each other's arms. Chester Pelton slept placidly as they kissed and whispered endearments. It was Claire who terminated the embrace, looking apprehensively at her slumbering father. "'Ralph, what's it all about?' she asked. "'I didn't even know that you and Frank Carden knew each other, let alone that he had any idea about us.' Prestonby thought furiously, trying to find a safe path through the tangle of Claire Pelton's conflicting loyalties, trying to find a path between his own loyalties and his love for her, wondering how much it would be safe to tell her. "'And Cardin's gone completely cloak and dagger happy,' she continued. "'He's talking about plots against my father's life, and against me, and—' "'A lot of things are going on under cloaks, around here,' he told her. "'And under literate smocks, and under other kinds of costume. "'And a lot of daggers are out, too. "'You didn't know Frank Cardin was illiterate, did you?' "'Her eyes widened. "'I thought I was literate enough to spot literacy in anybody else,' she said. "'No, I never even suspected.' "'Somebody rapped on the door. "'Miss Pelton,' the sergeant's voice called. "'Visiphone call from Literates Hall.' "'Prestonby smiled. "'I'll take it, if you don't mind.' he said. I'm acting chief literate here now, I suppose. She followed him as he went out into Pelton's office. When he snapped on the screen, a young man in a white smock with the fraternity's executive section badge looked out of it. He gave a slight start when he saw Prestonby. Literate first class Ralph N. Prestonby, acting voluntarily for Pelton's purchaser's paradise during emergency, he said. Literate first class Armandez, executive section, the man in the screen replied. This call is in connection with the recent attack of Chester Pelton upon literate first-class Bain. Continue, understanding that we admit nothing, Prestonby told him. An extemporary session of the council has found Pelton guilty of assaulting literate Bain and has fined him ten million dollars, Armandez announced. We enter protest, Prestonby replied automatically. Wait a moment, literate. The council has also awarded Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise damages to the extent of ten million dollars for losses incurred by suspension of literate service, and voted censure against literate Bain for ordering said suspension without consent of the council. Furthermore, a new crew of literates, with their novices, guards, etc., is being sent at once to your store. Obviously, neither the fraternities, nor Pelton's, nor the public— would be benefited by returning literate Bain or any of his crew. He has been given another assignment. Thank you. And when can we expect this new crew of literates? Prestonby asked. The man in the screen consulted his watch. Probably inside of an hour. We've had to do some reshuffling. You know how these things are handled. And if you'll pardon me, literate, just what are you doing at Pelton's? I understood that you were principal of Mineola High School. That's a good question. Prestonby hastily assessed the circumstances and their implications. I'd suggest you ask it of my superior, Literate Lansdale, however. The literate in the screen blinked. That was the equivalent, for him, of anybody else's jaw dropping to his midriff. Well, a pleasure, literate. Good day. Miss Pelton, the man in the blue and orange suit, was still trying to catch her attention. Where are we going to put that stuff? Rough Ladderman's out in the store somewhere, and I can't get in touch with him. What did you say it was? she replied. Fireworks, for the peace day trade. We want to get it on sale about the middle of the month. This was a fine time to deliver them. Peace day isn't until the 10th of December. Put them down in the fireproof vault. That place is full of photographic film and sporting ammunition and other merchandise. "'Stuff we'll have to draw out to replace stock on the shelves during the sale,' the illiterate objected. "'The weather forecast for the next couple of days is fair,' Prestonby reminded her. "'Why not just pile the stuff on the top stage, beyond the control tower, and put up warning signs?' The man, Hushnecker, Prestonby remembered hearing Claire call him, nodded. "'That might be all right. We could cover the cases with tarpaulins.' A buzzer drew one of the illiterates to the handphone. He listened for a moment, and turned. "'Hey, there's a Mrs. H. Armitage Zidanowich down in Furs. She wants to buy one of those mutated mink coats, and she's only got half a million bucks with her. How's her credit?' 
Claire handed Prestonby a black-bound book. Confidential credit rating guide. Look her up for us, she said. Another buzzer rasped. Before Prestonby could find the entry on Zdanowich, H. Armitage, the illiterate office worker, laying down one phone, grabbed up another. They're all out of small money and notions. Every son and his brother's been in there the last hour to buy a pair of dollar shoestrings with a grand note. I'll take care of that, Hutchnaker said. Wait till I call Control Tower and tell them about the fireworks. How much does Mrs. H. Armitage Zadanowicz want credit for? Prestonby asked. The book says her husband's good for up to fifteen million, or fifty million, in thirty days. Those coats are only five million, Claire said. Let her have it. Be sure to get her thumbprint, though, and send it up here for comparison. Oh, Claire, do you know how we're going to handle this new literate crew when they get here? Yes. The, here's the T.O. for literate service. She tossed a big chart across the desk to him. I made a few notes on it. You can give it to whoever is in charge. It went on like that for the next hour. When the new literate crew arrived, Prestonby was delighted to find a friend and a fellow follower of Lansdale in charge. Considering that retail merchandising was Wilton Joyner's section, that was a good omen. Lansdale must have succeeded to an extraordinary degree in imposing his will on the Grand Council. Prestonby found, however, that he would need some time to brief the new chief literate on the operational details at the store. He was unwilling to bring Claire too prominently into the conference, although he realized that it would be a matter of half an hour at the outside before every one of the new literate crew would have heard about her literate ability. If she'd only played dumb after opening that safe. Finally, by 1300, the new literates had taken over and the sale was running smoothly again. Ladderman was somewhere out in the store helping them. Claire had lunch for herself and Prestonby sent up from the restaurant and for a while they ate in silence, broken by occasional spatters of small talk. Then she returned to the question she had raised and had not yet answered. End of Section 3《Section 4 of Null ABC》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Schultz. Null ABC by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. You say Frank Cardin's illiterate? she asked. Then what's he doing managing the senator's campaign? Fifth columning? He shook his head. You think the fraternities are a solid, monolithic organization. Everybody agreed on aims and means, and working together in harmony? <laughs> That's how it's supposed to look, from the outside. On the inside, though, there's a bitter struggle going on between two factions, over policy and for control. One faction wants to maintain the status quo, a handful of literates doing the reading and writing for an illiterate public and holding a monopoly on literacy. There, headed by two men, Wilton Joyner and Harvey Graves. Bain was one of that faction. He paused, thinking quickly. If Lansdale had gotten the upper hand, there was likely to be a revision of the Joyner-Graves' attitude toward Pelton. In that case, the less he said to incriminate Russell Latterman, the better. Let Bain be the villain for a while, he decided. Bain, he continued, is one of a small minority of fanatics who make a religion of literacy. I believe he disposed of your father's medicine and then deliberately goaded him into a rage to bring on a heart attack. That doesn't represent Joyner Graves' policy. It was just something he did on his own. He's probably been disciplined for it by now. But the Joyner Graves faction are working for your father's defeat and the re-election of Grant Hamilton. The other faction is headed by a man you've probably never heard of, William R. Lansdale. I'm of his faction, and so is Frank Cardin. We want to see your father elected, because the socialization of literacy would eventually put the literates in complete control of the government. We also want to see literacy become widespread, eventually universal, just as it was before World War IV. But wouldn't that mean the end of the fraternities? Claire asked. 
That's what Joyner and Graves say. We don't believe so. And suppose it did. Lansdale says, if we're so incompetent that we have to keep the rest of the world in ignorance to earn a living, the world's better off without us. He says that every oligarchy carries in it the seeds of its own destruction, that if we can't evolve with the rest of the world, we're doomed in any case. That's why we want to elect your father. If he can get his socialized literacy program adopted, we'll be in a position to load the public with so many controls and restrictions and formalities that even the most bigoted illiterate will want to learn to read. Lansdale says... A private monopoly like ours is bad, but a government monopoly is intolerable, and the only way the public can get rid of it would be by becoming literates themselves. She glanced toward the door of Pelton's private rest room. Poor senator, she said softly. He hates literacy so, and his own children are literates, and his program against literacy is being twisted against itself. "'But you agree that we're right and he's wrong?' Prestonby asked. "'You must, or you'd never have come to me to learn to read.' "'He's such a good father. I'd hate to see him hurt,' she said. "'But, Ralph, you're my man. Anything you're for, I'm for. And anything you're against, I'm against.' He caught her hand across the table, forgetful of the others in the office. "'Claire, now that everybody knows—' he began. Top emergency, top emergency, a voice brayed out of the alarm box on the wall. Serious disorder in Department 32, serious disorder in Department 32. The voice broke off as suddenly as it had begun, but the box was not silent. From it came a medley of shouts, curses, feminine screams, and splintering crashes. Prestonby and Claire were on their feet. You have wall screens? he asked. How do they work? like the ones at school? Claire twisted a knob until the number 32 appeared on a dial and pressed a button. On the screen, the Chinaware department on the third floor came to life, in full sound and color. The pickup must have been across an aisle from the box from whence the alarm had come. They could see one of Pelton's illiterate clerks lying unconscious under it, and the handphone dangling at the end of its cord. The aisles were full of jostling, screaming women, trampling one another and fighting frantically to get out, and among them groups of three or four men were gathered back to back. One such group had caught a store policeman. Three were holding him, while a fourth smashed vases over his head, grabbing them from a nearby counter. A pink dinner plate came skimming up from the crowd, narrowly missing the wired TV pickup. A moment later, a blue and white sugar bowl, thrown with better aim, came curving at them in the screen. It scored a hit and brought darkness, though the bedlam of sound continued. Cardin looked at his watch as he entered the council chamber at Literates Hall, smoothing his smock hastily under his Sam Brown. He'd made it with very little time to spare, before the doors would be sealed and the meeting would begin. He'd been all over town, tracking down that report of Sforza's, He'd even made a quick visit to Chinatown, on the off chance that China had been used in an attempt at the double concealment of the obvious, but, as he'd expected, he'd found nothing. The people there hardly knew there was to be an election. Accustomed for millennia to ideographs read only by experts, they viewed the current uproar about literacy with unconcern. At the door he deposited his pocket recorder. No sound recording device was permitted, except the big audiovisual camera in front, which made the single permanent record. Going around the room counterclockwise to the seats of his faction, he encountered two other Lansdale men, Gerald K. Toppington of the technological section, thin-faced, sandy-haired, balding, and Franklin R. Chernoff, commander of the local literate guards brigade, with his ragged gray mustache, his horribly scarred face, and his outsized tablet holster, almost as big as a mail-order catalog. "'What's Joyner Graves trying to do to us, Frank?' Chernoff rumbled gutturally. "'It's what we're going to do to them,' Cardin replied. "'Didn't the chief tell you?' Chernoff shook his head. "'No time. I only got here fifteen minutes ago, chasing all over town about that tip from Sforza. Nothing, of course. Nothing from Sforza, either. The thing must have been planned weeks ago, whatever it is.' and everybody briefed personally, and nothing on disc or tape about it. But what's going to happen here? Lansdale gonna pull a rabbit out of his hat? Cardin explained. 
Chernoff whistled. Man, that's no rabbit. That's a full-grown Bengal tiger. I hope it doesn't eat us by mistake. Cardin looked around, saw Lansdale in animated argument with a group of his associates. Some of the others seemed to be sharing Chernoff's fears. I have every confidence in the chief, Toppington said. If his tigers make a meal off anybody, it'll be— he nodded in the direction of the other side of the chamber, where Wilton Joyner, short, bald, pompous, and Harvey Graves, tall and cadaverous, stood in a rosencrantz guildenstern attitude, surrounded by half a dozen of their top associates. The council president, Moorhead, came out a little door onto the rostrum and took his seat, pressing a button. The call bell began clanging slowly. Lansdale, glancing around, saw Cardin and nodded. On both sides of the chamber the literates began taking seats, and finally the call bell stopped, and literate President Moorhead rapped with his gavel. The opening formalities were hustled through. The routine held over business was rubber-stamped with hasty votes of approval, even including the decisions of the extemporary meeting of that morning on the affair at Pelton's. Finally, the presiding officer rapped again and announced that the meeting was now open for new business. At once, Harvey Graves was on his feet. "'Literate President,' he began, as soon as the chair had recognized him, "'this is scarcely new business, since it concerns a problem, a most serious problem, which I and some of my colleagues have brought to the attention of this council many times in the past, the problem of black literacy.' He spat out the two words as though they were a mouthful of poison. Literate president and fellow literates, if anything could destroy our fraternities, to which we have given our lives devotion, it would be the widespread tendency to bypass the fraternities, the practice of literacy by non-fraternities people. We've heard all that before, Wilton, somebody from the Lansdale side called out. What do you want to talk about that you haven't gotten on every record of every meeting for the last thirty years? Why, this Pelton business, Graves snapped back at him. You know what I mean. Your own associates are responsible for it. He turned back to face the chair, and, with a surprising minimum of invective, described the scene in which Claire Pelton had demonstrated her literacy. And that's not all, brother literates, he continued. Since then, I've been receiving reports from the Pelton store. Claire Pelton has been openly doing the work of a literate, going over the store's written records, checking inventories, checking the credit guide, handling the price lists. What's that got to do with black literacy? Gerald Toppington demanded. Black literacy is a term which labels the professional practice of literacy for hire by a non-fraternity literate, or literate service furnished for criminal or politically subversive purposes, or the betrayal of a client by a fraternity literate. There's nothing of the sort involved here. This girl, who does appear to be literate, is simply looking after the interests of her family's business. She was taught by a literate a fraternity's member under to say the very least irregular circumstances and without payment of any fee any fee that is that the fraternities can collect any percentage on and the literate who taught her also taught her younger brother ray pelton and this literate who is known to be her lover suppose he is her lover so what one of lansdale's partisans demanded you say yourself that she's illiterate that ought to remove any objection. Why, if she were to come forward and admit and demonstrate her literacy, there'd be no possible objection from the fraternity's viewpoint to her marrying young Prestonby. And as for Prestonby's action in teaching literacy to her and her brother, Cardin spoke up, I think he deserves the thanks and commendation of the fraternities. He's put a period to four generations of bigoted illiterates. Wilton Joyner was on his feet. "'Will literate Graves yield for a motion?' he asked. "'Thank you, Harvey. "'Literate President and Brother Literates, "'I yield to no man in my abhorrence of black literacy, "'or in my detestation for the political principles "'of which Chester Pelton has made himself the spokesman, "'but I deny that we should allow the acts and opinions "'of the illiterate parent to sway us "'in our consideration of the literate children. "'It has come to my notice.' as it has to literate graves, 
that this young woman claire pelton is literate to a degree that would be a credit to any literate first class and her brother can match his literacy creditably against that of any novice in our fraternities to show that we respect literate ability wherever we find it to show that we are not the monopolistic closed corporation our enemies accuse us of being to show that we are not animated by a vindictive hatred of anything bearing the name of pelton i move and ask that my motion be presented for seconding that claire pelton and her brother raymond pelton be duly elected respectively to the positions of literate third class and literate novice as members of the associated fraternities of literates from the joiner grave side there were dutiful cries of yes yes admit the young pelton and also gasps of horrified surprise from the rank and filers who hadn't been briefed on what was coming up lansdale was on his feet in an instant literate president he cried in view of the delicate political situation and in view of chester pelton's violent denunciation of our fraternities literate lansdale the president objected the motion is not to be debated until it has been properly seconded what does the literate president think i'm doing lansdale retorted i second the motion joyner looked at lansdale in angry surprise which gradually became a fearful suspicion his stooge who had already risen with a prepared speech of seconding simply gaped furthermore lansdale continued i move an amendment to literate joiner's motion i move that the ceremony of the administration of the literate's oath and the investiture in the smock and insignia be carried out as soon as possible and that an audio-visual recording be made and telecast this evening before twenty one hundred brigade commander chernoff prodded by cardin jumped to his feet excellent he cried i second the motion to amend the motion of literate joiner if there were such a thing as a bomb which would explode stunned silence lansdale and chernoff had dropped such a bomb cardin could guess how joiner and graves felt they were now beginning to be afraid of their own proposition as for the lansdale literates he knew how many of them felt he'd felt the same way himself when lansdale had proposed the idea he got to his feet literate president brother literates he raised his voice i call for an immediate vote on this amended motion which i personally endorse most heartily and which i hope to see carried unanimously now wait a minute joiner objected this motion ought to be debated what do you want to debate about it chernoff demanded you presented it didn't you well i wanted to give the council an opportunity to discuss it as typical of our problems in dealing with black i mean non-fraternities literacy you mean you didn't know it was loaded cardin told him well that's your hard luck we're going to squeeze the trigger i withdraw the motion joiner shouted literate president lansdale said gently his thin face lighting with an almost saintly smile literate joiner simply cannot withdraw his motion now it has been properly seconded and placed before the house and so has my own humble contribution to it i demand that the motion be acted upon vote 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 the lansdale literates began yelling i call on all my adherents to vote against this motion joiner shouted now look here wilton harvey graves shouted reddening with anger you're just making a fool out of me this was your idea in the first place do you want to smash everything we've ever done in the fraternities harvey we can't go on with it joiner replied he crossed quickly to graves seat and whispered something for the record lansdale said sweetly our colleague literate joiner has just whispered to literate graves that since i have seconded his motion he's now afraid of it i think literate graves is trying to assure him that my support is merely a bluff for the information of this body i want to state categorically that it is not and that i will be deeply disappointed if this motion does not pass an elderly literate on the joiner graves side an undersized man with a bald head and a narrow mouth was on his feet he looked like an aged rat brought to bay by a terrier i was against this fool idea from the start he yelled we've got to keep the illiterates down 
how are we ever going to do that if we go making literates out of them but you two thought you were being smart shut up and sit down you old jackass one of the joiner's people shouted at him shut up yourself ginter a hatchet-faced woman literate from the finance section squawked literate president moorhead an amiable and ineffective maiden aunt in trousers pounded frantically with his gavel order he fairly screamed this is disgraceful you can say that again brigade commander chernoff boomed what do you people over on the right think this is an illiterate organizational political action meeting vote vote cardin bellowed literate president morad banged his gavel and in a last effort started the call bell clanging the motion has been presented and seconded the amendment has been presented and seconded it will now be put to a vote roll call cardin demanded four or five other voices from both sides of the chamber supported him the vote will be by roll call literate president moorhead agreed addison walter g i he was a subordinate of harvey graves agostino pedro v i he was a lansdale man so it went on graves voted for the motion joiner voted against it all the lansdale faction now convinced that their leader had the opposition on the run voted loudly for it the vote has been one hundred and eighty-three for seventy-two against literate president morehead finally announced the motion is herewith declared carried literate lansdale i appoint you to organize a committee to implement the said motion at once preston b flung open the door of the rest room where sergeant cocazello and his subordinate were guarding the unconscious pelton sergeant who's in charge of store police now cocazello looked blank for an instant i guess i am he said lieutenant dunbar is off on his vacation in mexico and captain freiser's in the hospital he was taken sick suddenly last evening probably poisoned preston b thought making a mental note to find out which hospital and get in touch with one of the literate medics there well come out here sergeant and have a look around the store on the t v we have troubles cocozello could hear the noise that was still coming out of the darkened screen as he stepped forward claire got another pickup some distance from the one that had been knocked out a mob of women customers were surging away from the chinaware department into glassware they were running into the shopping crowd there with considerable disturbance a couple of store police were trying to get through the packed mass of humanity and making slow going of it cocozello swore and started calling on his reserves on one of the handphones wait a minute sergeant preston b stopped him don't commit any of your reserves down there we're going to need them to hold the executive country up here this is only the start of a general riot who are you and what do you know about it cocozello challenged listen to him guido claire said he knows what he's doing claire you have some way of keeping a running count of the number of customers in and out of the store haven't you preston b asked why yes here she pointed to an indicator on chester pelton's desk where constantly changing numbers danced and don't you have a continuous check on sales too how do they jibe they don't look sales are away below any expectation from the number of customers even allowing for shopping habits of a bargain day crowd but what's that got to do preston b was back at the t v shifting from pickup to pickup look sergeant claire that isn't a normal bargain day crowd is it look at those groups of men three or four to a group shifting around waiting for something to happen this store's been infiltrated by a big goon gang that business in china wears just the start to draw our reserves down to the third floor look at that now he had a pickup on the twelfth floor the floor just under the public landing stages and at the foot of the escalators leading to the central executive block see how they're concentrating there he pointed out in that ladies wear department there are three men for every woman and the men are all drifting from counter to counter over in the direction of our escalators cocozello swore again feelingly literate you know your stuff he said 
That fuss in China is just a feint. This is where they're really going to hit. What do you think it is? Macy and Gimbel's trying to bust up our sale? Or politics? Prestonby shrugged. Take your choice. A competitor would concentrate where your biggest volume of sale was going on, though. Political enemies would try to get up here, and that's what this gang's trying to do. He's absolutely right, Guido, Claire told the sergeant. Do whatever he tells you. Sergeant Cocazello looked at him, awaiting orders. We can't commit our reserves in that Chinaware department fight. We need them up here. Where are they now, and how many? Thirteen, counting myself and the man in there. He nodded toward the room where Chester Pelton lay in drugged sleep. In the squad room, on the floor below. And for the mob below to get up here? Two escalators, sir northeast and southwest corners of the office country and we got some new counters that mr latterman had built that didn't get put out in time for the sale we can use them to build barricades if we have to how about a copter attack on the roof cocozello grinned i'd like to see that now literate we got plenty of aa equipment up there four seven millimeter machine guns two twelve millimeters and one twenty millimeter auto cannon we could hold off the state guard with that that isn't saying much, but they're not even that good. So it'll be the escalators. Think now, sergeant. Fires, burglary, hold-ups. The sergeant's grin widened. High-pressure fire hose, one at the head of each escalator, and a couple more that can be dragged over from other outlets. Say we put two men on each hose, lying down at the head of the escalators, and we got plenty of firearms. We can arm some of these clerks up here. All right, do that and put out an emergency call by interdepartment telephone not by public address to floor walkers from the fifth floor down to gather up all male clerks and other store personnel in their departments arm them with anything they can find and rush them to chinaware tell them to shout pelton when they hit the mob to avoid breaking each other's heads in the confusion tell them they're expected to hold the chinaware and glassware departments themselves without any help from the store police why not claire wanted to know that's how battles come to happen at the wrong time and place prestonby told her two small detachments collide and each sends back for reinforcements and the next thing anybody knows there's a full-size battle going on where nobody wants to fight one we're going to fight our main battle at the head of the escalators from the twelfth floor you've done this sort of work before literate cocozello grinned you talk like a storm troop captain <laughs> what else well, so far, we've just been talking defense. We need to take the offensive ourselves. He glanced around. Is there a freight elevator from this block to the basement? Yeah, wait till I see. Cocazello went to the TV screen and dialed. Yeah, and the elevator's up here too, he said. Well, you take what men you can spare, a couple of your cops and a couple of the office crew, arm them with pistols, carbines, clubs, whatever you please, and take them down to the basement gather up all the warehouse gang down there and arm them and as soon as you get to the basement send the elevator back up here that's our lifeline we can't risk having it captured you'll organize flying squads to go up into the store from the basement bust up any trouble that seems to be getting started if you can but your main mission will be to rescue store police literates literates guards and store help and get them back to the basement They'll be picked up from there and brought up here on the elevator. He picked up a pad from a desk and wrote a few lines on it. Show this to any literate you meet. Get literate Hopkinson to countersign it for you when you find him. Tell him we want his whole gang up here as soon as possible. How about getting help from outside? Claire asked. The city police or... City police won't lift a finger, Prestonby told her. They never help anybody who has a private police force. They have too much to do protecting John Q. Citizen. Hunchnecker, suppose you call Radical Socialist Campaign Headquarters. Tell them to rush some of their lone rangers around here. Russell M. Latterman was lunching in the store restaurant, at a table next to the thick glass partition, where he could look out across confectionery and pastries toward the tobacco shop and the liquor department. There were two ways of looking at it, of course. He was occupying a table that might have been used by a customer, but, on the other hand, he was known by sight to many of the customers, and the fact that he was eating here had some advertising value, 
and he could keep his eye on the business going on around him. Off in the distance, he caught the white flash of a literate smock at one of the counters, one of the new crew sent in to replace the ones Bain had pulled out. He was glad, and at the same time, disturbed. He had had his doubts about staging a literate strike, and he was almost positive that Wilton Joyner had known nothing about it. The whole thing had been Harvey Graves' idea. There was a serious question of literate ethics involved, to say nothing of the effect on the public. The trick of forcing Claire Pelton to reveal her secret literacy was all right, although he wished that it had been Frank Cardin who had opened that safe. Or did he? Cardin would have brazened it out, claimed to have memorized the combination after having learned it by observation, and would probably have gotten away with it. But that silly girl had lost her head afterward, and had gone on to brand herself, irrevocably, as illiterate. One of the waitresses was hurrying toward him, almost falling over herself in excitement. She began talking when she was ten feet from the table. "'Mr. Ladderman! Mr. Ladderman!' she was calling to him. "'A terrible fight! Down in Chinaware!' "'Well, what do we have store police for?' he demanded. "'They can take care of it. Now be quiet, Madge. Don't get the customers excited.' He returned to his lunch, watching, with satisfaction, the crowd that was packing into the liquor department next to the restaurant. That special loss leader, old Adam Baum Rye, had been a good idea. In the first place, the stuff was fit for nothing but cleaning drains and removing varnish. If he were Pelton, he would have fired that fool buyer who got them overstocked on it. But the audio advertiser outside was reiterating, "'Choice whiskies, two hundred dollars a sixth and up!' and pulling in the customers, who, when they discovered that the two-hundred-dollar bargain was old Adam Baum, were shelling out five hundred to a grand a sixth for good liquor. He finished his coffee and got to his feet. Be a good idea to look in on liquor and see how things were going. The department was getting more and more crowded every minute. Three customers were entering for every one who left. On the way, he passed two women and caught a snatch of conversation. Don't go down on the third floor, for heaven's sake terrible fight, smashing everything up. Worried, he continued into liquor, and the looks of the crowd there increased his worries. Too many men between twenty and thirty, all dressed alike, looking alike, talking and acting alike. It looked like a goon gang infiltration, and he was beginning to see why Harvey Graves had wanted the literates pulled out, and why Joyner, bound by ethics to do nothing against the commercial interests of Pelton's, had known nothing about it. He started toward a counter to speak to a clerk, but one of the stocky, quietly dressed young men stepped in front of him. "'Give me a bottle of atom bomb,' he said. "'Don't bother wrapping it.' "'Yes, sir.' The clerk seemed worried, too. He got the bottle and set it on the counter. "'That'll be 2C, sir.' "'I see you're wearing a radical socialist button,' the customer commented. "'Because you want to, or because Chet Pelton makes you?' "'Mr. Pelton never interferes with his employees' political convictions.' the clerk replied loyally. Saying nothing, the customer took the bottle, swung it by the neck, and smashed it over the clerk's head, knocking him senseless. That's all that rot gut's good for, the customer said, jumping over the counter. All right, boys, help yourselves. For a surprisingly long time, the riot was localized in China, where it had begun. Using alternately three TV pickups around the scene of the disturbance, Prestonby watched its progress, and watched successive details of store personnel, armed with clubs and a few knives and sono pistols, hit the riot, shouting their battle cry, and vanish. They were, of course, lambs of sacrifice, however unlamblike their conduct. They were buying time, and they were drawing groups of goons into the action in China and Glassware, who might have been making trouble elsewhere. There was an outbreak on the sixth floor, in liquor. Claire, touring the store on the other TV screen, spotted it and called his attention to it. Back of the shattered glass partition, a mob of men were snatching bottles from the shelves and tossing them out to the crowd. One of the clerks, in his gray uniform jacket, was lying unconscious outside. While Prestonby watched, another, and another, came flying out the doorway. A fourth victim, in ordinary business clothes, tattered and disheveled, came flying out after them, to land in a heap, stunned for an instant, and then pick himself up. Prestonby laughed heartily when he recognized literate, undercover, first-class Russell M. Ladderman. 
I ought to have anticipated that, he said. Any time there's a riot, the liquor stores are the first things looted. The liquor stores and the... Claire, see what's going on in sporting goods. Sporting goods, between tools and hardware and toys, on the fifth floor, was swamped. One of the clerks was lying on the floor in a puddle of blood, past any help. None of the others were in sight. The gun racks and pistol cases were being cleaned out systematically. This had been organized in advance. There were four or five men working industriously, wiping grease out of bores and actions before handing out firearms, and a couple more making sure that the right cartridges went with each weapon. Somebody had brought a small grinding wheel over from tools and plugged it in, and was grinding points on the foils and epées. Others were collecting baseball bats, golf clubs, and football helmets and catcher's masks. The tool department was being stripped of everything that could be used as a weapon, too. The whole store, by this time, was an approximation of mutiny in a madhouse. Dress goods was being looted by a howling mob of women who were pulling bolts of material from shelves and fighting among themselves over them. Somebody had turned on the electric fans, and long streams of flimsy fabric were blowing about like a surrealist maypole dance. Somebody in household furnishings had turned on a couple of fans, too, and a mob of hoodlums were opening cans of paint and throwing them into the fan blades. The little antiques department, in a corner of the fourth floor back of the gift shop, was an island of peace in the general chaos. There was only one way into it, and one of the clerks, who had gotten himself into a suit of fifteenth-century battle armor, was standing in the entrance, leaning on a two-hand sword. There was blood on the long blade, and more blood splashed on the floor in front of him. He was being left entirely alone. End of Section 4《Section 5 of Null ABC》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Schultz. — Null ABC by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire Hutchnecker called to the telephone, spoke briefly listened for a while, spoke again in hearty thanks, and hung up. Macy and Gimbel's, he told Preston B. They heard about our trouble, probably one of their price spotters phoned in about it, and they're offering to send twenty of their store cops to help us out. They'll be landing on our stage in eight minutes, rifles and steel helmets. Preston B. nodded. It would have been quite conceivable that Pelton's chief competitor had started the riot. Since they hadn't, their offer of armed aid was just as characteristic of the bitter but mutually respectful rivalries of the commercial world. A few minutes later another call came in, this time on the visiphone. Preston betook it when he saw a literate guard's officer in the screen and recognized him. "'That you, Preston B?' the officer, Major Slater, asked in some surprise. "'Didn't know you were at Pelton's. What's going on there?' Preston B told him, briefly. Yes, we had some of our people at the store, in plain clothes, Slater said, just in case of trouble, on Mr. L.'s orders. They reported a riot starting, but naturally their reports were incomplete. Can you get one of your landing stages cleared for us? We have two hundred men in twenty copters. Then he must have noticed some of the store illiterates back of Prestonby, and realized that this offer of help to literacy's worst enemy would arouse suspicion. Not that we care what happens to Chester Pelton, but we have to protect our own people at the store. Yes, of course, Preston B. agreed. Come in on our north stage. You'll probably find a fight going on on our twelfth floor, just inside. Anybody who's trying to get up the escalators to the office block will be an enemy. Right. We're halfway there now. The literate's guard's officer broke the connection. You heard that? he asked, turning to the others in the office. If we can hold out till they get here, we're all right. Did you contact Radical Socialist Headquarters yet, Hutchnecker? Yes, I talked to a fellow named Yingling. He said that all the party storm troops had been lured out to some kind of a disturbance in North Jersey Borough. He'd try to get them recalled. Prestonby swore bitterly. By the time his own party goons get here, the literates guards and Macy and Gimbel's will have pulled Pelton's bacon off the fire for him. 
Nice friends he has. An alarm buzzer went off suddenly, and an urgent voice came out of the box on the wall. Here come the goons! South escalator! Prestonby grabbed a burp gun and a canvas musette bag full of clips. By the time he had gotten down to what, in deference to the superstitions of the illiterate store force, was known as the fourteenth floor, an attack on the north escalator had developed as well. In both cases, the attackers seemed to expect no organized resistance. They simply jumped onto the escalators, adding their own running speed, and came rushing up, firing pistols ahead of them at random. The defenders, however, had been ready. The fire hoses caught those in the lead and hurled them back. Some of them vaulted the barrier between the ascending and descending spirals and let themselves be carried down again. Less than five minutes after the buzzer had sounded the warning, the attack stopped. The noise on the twelfth floor increased, however, and, leaning over into the escalator way, Prestonby could see the rioters firing in the direction of the entrance from the north landing stage. Within a matter of thirty seconds, they began to flee, and a wave of literates' guards in their futuristic space cadet uniforms came pouring in after them. Douglas MacArthur Yetzko put the burp gun back together again, tried the action, and laid it aside with a sigh. He had cleaned every weapon in his and Prestonby's private arsenal since lunch, and now he had to admit the unpalatable fact that there was nothing left to do but turn on the TV. Ray had been no company at all. The boy hadn't spoken a word since he'd started rummaging among the captain's books. Gloomily, he snapped on the screen to sample the soap shows. Della's palace was in jail again, this time accused of murdering the lawyer who had gotten her acquitted on a previous murder rap. Considering the fact that she had languished in jail for almost a year during the other trial, Yetzko felt that she had a sound motive. Rudolph Barstow, in Broadway Wife, was, like Bruce's spider, spinning his five-hundredth web to ensnare the glamorous Marie novel. And there was a show about a schoolteacher and her class of angelic little tots that almost brought Yetzko's lunch up. He shifted the dial again. A young, literate announcer was speaking quickly, excitedly. Scene of the riot, already the worst this year, and growing steadily worse. We take you now to downtown Manhattan, where our portable units and commentators have just arrived, and switch you to Ed Morgan. The screen went black, and Yetzko swore angrily. Ray lifted his head quickly from his book and reached for the sono pistol Yetzko had given him. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and just a moment until we can give you the picture. We're having what is usually labeled as slight technical difficulties. In this case, the difficulty of avoiding having a hole shot in our camera or in your commentator's head. Yes, that's shooting you here. There, somebody's using an auto rifle. How are you coming, Steve? A voice muttered something which, two centuries ago, would have caused an earth-shaking scandal in the whole radio-TV industry. Well, till Steve gets things fixed up, a brief review, to date, of what's sure to go down in history as the Battle of Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise. Huh? Ray fairly shouted, the book forgotten. Started in the Chinaware Department as a relatively innocent brawl and spread to the Liquor Department, and then all of a sudden everybody started playing rough. At first, it was suspected that Macy and Gimbles had sent a goon gang around to break up Pelton's fall sale, but when the former concern rallied to the assistance of their competitor with a force of twenty riflemen, that began to look less likely, and we're beginning to think that it might be the work of some of Pelton's political enemies. About ten minutes ago, Major James F. Slater of the Literates Guards arrived with two hundred of his men to protect the Literates on duty at the store. They captured the entire twelfth floor, where we are now, with the exception of the ladies' lingerie and hosiery departments around one of the escalators to the lower floors. Here, the gang who started the riot, and who are now donning white hoods to distinguish themselves from the various other factions involved, have thrown up barricades of counters and display tables, and are fighting bitterly to keep control of the escalator head. Ah, here we are. The screen lit suddenly, and they were looking, Ray over Yetzko's shoulder, across the devastated expanse of what had been the ladies' frocks department, toward lingerie and hosiery, which seemed to have been thoroughly looted then stripped of everything that could be used to build a barricade. Seems to have been quite a number of heavy copters just landed on the east stage filled with more goons, probably to reinforce the gang back of that barricade. The firing's gotten noticeably heavier. 
Yetsko had turned from the screen and was pawing in the arms locker. For a job like this, he'd need firepower. He took the ten-shot clip from the butt of his pistol and inserted one with a curling one-hundred-shot drum at the bottom and shoved two more like it into the pockets of his jacket. And now, something to clear the way with, he took out a three-foot length of weighted fire hose. Then he saw Ray. That kid was pinning him down here while the captain was probably fighting for his life. But the captain told him to stay with Ray. He dropped the weighted hose. "'What's the matter, Doug?' the boy asked. "'Pick it up and let's get going.' He shook his head. "'Can't. The captain told me I had to take care of you.' The boy opened his mouth to speak, closed it again, and thought for a moment. Then he asked, "'Doug, didn't Captain Prestonby tell you to stay with me?' "'Yes.' "'All right. You do just that, because I'm going to help Claire and the senator. That's who that goon gang's after.' Yetsko considered the proposition for a moment, horrified. Why, this was the captain's girl's kid brother. If anything happened to him... His mind refused to contemplate what the captain would do to him. No, you gotta stay here, Ray, he said. The captain... Then his eye caught the screen. Ed Morgan must have found a place where he could run his camera up on an extension rod from behind something. They were looking down, from almost ceiling height, at the barricade and at the literate's guards who were firing from cover at it. A sudden blast of automatic weapons burst from the barricade. More men in white hoods came boiling up the escalator, and they all rushed forward. The few literate's guards' skirmishers were overwhelmed. He saw one of them, a man he knew, Sam Ego, from Company 5, go down wounded. He saw one of the white-hooded goons pause to brain him with a carbine butt before charging on. "'Why, you dirty, rotten, illiterate!' he roared, retrieving his weighted hose. "'Come on, Ray, let's go!' Ray hesitated, as though in thought. "'Ken Dorchin, Harry Cobb, Dick Hirschfield, Jerry McCarty, Ramon Nogales, Pete Shawnee, Tom Hutchinson.' "'Oh?' Yetsko began. "'What have they got to do with—' "'We need a gang.' The two of us last about as long as a pint of beer at a Dutch picnic. Ray went to the desk, grabbed a pen, and made a list of names, in a fair imitation of Ralph Prestonby's neat block printing. Give this to the girl outside and tell her to have them called for and sent in here, the boy directed. And see if you can find us some transport. I think there ought to be a couple of big copters finished down at the shops. And if you can find a couple more literate guards you can talk into going with us— Yetsko nodded and took the paper without question. He was not, and he would be the first to admit it, of the thinking type. He was a good sergeant, but he had to have an officer to tell him what to do. Ray Pelton might be only fifteen years old, but his sister was the captain's girl, and that put him in the officer class. A very young and recently commissioned second lieutenant, say, but definitely an officer. Yetsko took the list and looked at it. Like most literate guards, he could read after a fashion. He recognized the names. The boys were all members of the top-floor secret society. He went out and gave the list to Martha Collins. He had expected some argument with her, but she seemed to accept Ray Pelton's printing as Prestonby's. She began checking room charts and class lists and calling for the boys to be sent at once to the office. He went out and down to the copter repair shop, where he found that a big four-ton air truck that the senior class had been working on for several weeks was finished. Yes, I had it up myself this morning. Flew it over to the Bronx and back with a load of supplies. Okay, have somebody you can trust, one of your guards preferably. Bring it around behind the administration wing. Captain Prestonby wants it. I'm to take some boys from fourth-year civics on a tour. Something about election campaign methods. The instructor called a literate's guard and gave him instructions. Yetsko went to the guard's squad room on the second floor, where he found half a dozen of the reserves loafing. All right, you guys start earning your pay, he said. We're going to a party. The men got to their feet and began gathering their weapons. Mason, he continued, you have your big copter here. The gang of you can all get in it. I'm taking off in a four-ton truck with some of these kids. I want you boys to follow us. We're going to Pelton's store. There's a fight going on there, and the captain's in the middle of it. We gotta get him out. 
They all looked at him in puzzled surprise, but nobody gave him any argument. Funny, now that he thought of it, it had been quite a long time since anybody had ever given him any argument about anything. A couple of guys out in Pittsburgh had tried it, but somehow they'd lost interest in arguing after a little. When he returned to the office and opened the door, a blast of shots greeted him through the open door of Preston B.'s private office. He had his pistol out before he realized that the shooting was going on at Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise ten miles away. Literate Martha Collins in the inner room was fairly screaming, "'Shut that infernal thing off and listen to me!' The dozen odd boys whom Ray had recruited for the improvised relief expedition were pulling weapons out of the gun locker, pawing through the boxes on the ammunition shelf, trying to explain to one another the working of the machine carbines and burp guns. Yetzko shouldered through them and turned down the sound volume of the TV. "'This is absolutely outrageous!' literate Martha Collins stormed at him. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself, taking these children to a murderous battle like that!' "'Well, maybe it ain't right using savages in a civilized riot,' Yetzko admitted. "'But I don't care. The captain's in a jam, and I'd use live devils if I could catch a few.' He took a burp gun from one of the boys, who had opened the action and couldn't get it closed again. "'Here, you kids don't want this kind of stuff,' he reproved. "'Sano guns and sleep-gas guns, that's all right. But these things are killing tools.' "'It's what we have to use, Doug,' Ray told him. "'Things have been happening since you went out. Look at the screen.' Yetzko looked and swore blisteringly. Then he gave the burp gun back to the boy. "'Look, you gotta press this little gizmo here to let the action shut when there's no clip in or when the clip's empty. When you got a loaded clip in, you just pull back on this and let go.' Frank Cardin looked at his watch and saw that it was 13.45, as it had been ten seconds before, when he had last looked. He started to drum nervously on his chair arm with his fingers, then caught himself as he saw Lansdale, who must have been every bit as anxious as himself, standing outwardly calm and unruffled. "'Well, that's the situation which now confronts us, brother literates,' the slender, white-haired man was finishing. You must see by now that the policy of unyielding opposition of which some of you have advocated and pursued is futile. You know the policy I favor, which now remains the only policy we can follow. It is summed up in that law of political strategy. If you can't lick em, join em, and, after joining, take control. In spite of the radical socialist victory in this state at tomorrow's election, it will not be possible, in the next Congress, to enact Pelton's socialized literacy program into law. The radicals will not be able to capture enough seats in the lower house, and there are too many uncontested seats in the Senate now held by independent conservatives. But, and this is inevitable, barring some unforeseen accident of the order of a political cataclysm, they will control both houses of Congress after the election of 2144, two years hence, and we can also be sure that two years hence, Chester Pelton will be nominated and overwhelmingly elected president of the Consolidated States of North America. Six months thereafter, the socialized literacy program will be the law of the land. So, we have until mid-2145 to make our preparations. I would estimate that, if we do not destroy ourselves by our own folly in the meantime, we should, two years thereafter, be in complete if secret, control of the whole consolidated state's government. If any of you question that last statement, you can merely ask yourselves one question. How, in the name of all that is rational, can illiterates control and operate a system of socialized literacy? Who but literates can keep such a program from disintegrating into complete and indescribable confusion? I don't ask for any decision at this time. I do not ask for any debate at this time. Let each of us consider the situation in his or her own mind, and let us meet again a week from today to consider our future course of action, each of us realizing that any decision we take then will determine forever the fate of our fraternities. He looked around the room. Thank you, brother literates, he said. Instantly, Cardin was on his feet with a motion to recess the meeting until 1300 the following Monday, and Brigade Commander Chernoff seconded the motion immediately. As soon as literate President Moorhead's gavel banged, Cardin, still on his feet, was running for the double doors at the rear. 
the two literates guards on duty there got them unsealed and opened by the time he had reached them there was another guard in the hall waiting for him with a little record desk for major slater call came in about ten minutes ago he said Cardin snapped the disc into his recorder reproducer and put in the earplug. Frank, Slater's voice came out of the small machine. You'd better get busy or you won't have any candidate when the polls open tomorrow. Just got a call from Pelton's store. Place infiltrated by goons. Estimated strength 200. Presumed independent conservatives. Serious rioting already going on. I'm taking my reserve company there. And if you haven't found out yet where China is... It's on the third floor, next to glassware. Cardin pulled out the earplug, stuffed the recorder into his trouser pocket, and began unbuckling his Sam Brown as he ran for the nearest wall visiphone. He was dialing the guard room on that floor with one hand as he took off the belt. Get a big ambulance on the roof with a literate medic and orderly driver, he ordered, unbuttoning his smock. And four guards, plain clothes if possible, but don't waste time changing clothes if you don't have anybody out of uniform. Heavy-duty sonoguns, sleep gas projectors, gas masks, and pistols. Hurry! He threw the smock and belt at the guard. Here, Pancho, put these away for me. Thanks. He tossed the last word back over his shoulder as he ran for the escalator. It was three eternal minutes after he had reached the landing stage above before the ambulance arrived, medic and orderly on the front seat and the four guards, all in conservatively cut civilian clothes, inside. He crowded in beside the medic, told him, Pelton's store, and snapped the door shut as the big white copter began to rise. They climbed to 5,000 feet, and then the driver nosed his vehicle up, cut his propeller and retracted it, and fired his rocket, aiming toward downtown Manhattan. Four minutes later, after the rocket stopped firing and they were on the down curve of their trajectory, the propeller was erected and they began letting down toward the central landing stage of Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise. Cardin cut in the TV and began calling the control tower. Ambulance! To evacuate Mr. Pelton! he called. What's the score down there? One of Pelton's traffic control men appeared on Cardin's screen. You're safe to land on the central stage, but you'd better come in at a long angle from the north, he said. We control the north public stage, but the east and south stages are in the hands of the goons. They'd fire on you. Land beside that big pile of boxes under tarpaulins up here. But be careful. It's fireworks we didn't have time to get into storage. The ambulance came slanting in from uptown, and Cardin looked around anxiously. The mayfly dance of customers' copters had stopped. There was a Sabbath stillness about the big store, at least visually. A few small figures in literate guards of black leather moved about on the north landing stage, and several Pelton employees were on the central stop stage. The howling of the copter propeller overhead effectively blocked out any sounds that might be coming from the building, at least until the ambulance landed. Then a spatter of firing from below was audible. Cardin, the medic, and the guards piled out, the latter with the stretcher. The orderly driver got out his tablet pistol and checked the chamber, then settled into a posture of watchful relaxation. Major Slater was waiting for them by one of the vertical lift platforms. I tried to get hold of you, but that blasted meeting was going on, and they had the door sealed, and... he began. Cardin hushed him quickly. Around here, I'm an illiterate, he warned. Where's Pelton? We've got to get him and his daughter out of here, at once. He's still flat on his back, out cold, Slater said. The medic you sent around here gave him a shot of hypnotane. He'll be out for a couple of hours yet. Prestonby's still here. He's commanding the defense, doing a good job, too. And that was good. Ralph would help get Claire to Literates Hall, after they'd gotten her father to safety. There must be about five hundred independent conservative stormtroopers in the store, Slater was saying. Most of them got here after we did. The city cops have all the street approaches roped off. They're letting nobody but Grant Hamilton's thugs in. They were fairly friendly this morning, Cardin said. Mayor Jameson must have passed the word. They all got off the lift two floors down, where they found Claire Pelton and Ralph Prestonby waiting. Hello, Ralph. Claire, what's the situation? We have all of the twelfth floor, Prestonby said. We have about half the eleventh, including the north and west public stages. We have the basement, and the storerooms, and the warehouse. Sergeant Calcazello's down there, with as many of the store police and literates and literates guards and store help as he could salvage, 
and the warehouse gang. They've taken most of the ground floor, the main mezzanine, and parts of the second floor. We moved two of the seven-millimeter machine guns down from the top, and we control the front street entrance with them and a couple of sono guns. The stores isolated from the outside by the city police, who are allowing reinforcements to come through for the raiders, but we're managing to stop them at the doors. Have you called Radical Socialist Headquarters for help? Yes, half a dozen times. There's some fellow named Yingling there who says that all their storm troops are over in North Jersey on some kind of false alarm riot call and can't be contacted. So, Cardin commented gently, that's too bad now. Too bad for Horace Yingling and Joe West. This time tomorrow, there'll be a pair of dead traitors, he thought. Well, we'll have to make do with what we have. Where's Russ Latterman, by the way? Prestonby gave a sidewise glance toward Claire and shook his head, his lips pressed tightly together. She doesn't know yet, Cardin interpreted. Down in the basement with Calcazello, Prestonby said aloud. We're in telephone communication with Calcazello and have a freight elevator running between here and the basement. Calcazello says Latterman is using a rifle against the raiders, killing everyone he can get a shot at. Cardin nodded probably vindictive about being involved in an action injurious to Pelton's commercial interests, just another odd quirk of literate ethics. "'We'd better get him up here,' he said. "'You and I have got to leave at once. We have to get Pelton and Claire to safety. He can help Major Slater till we can get back with reinforcements. I am going to kill a man named Horace Yingling, and then I am going to round up the storm troops he diverted on a wild goose chase to North Jersey.' He nodded to the medic and the four plainclothes guards. Get Pelton on the stretcher. Better use the canvas flaps and the straps. He's under hypnotane, but it's likely to be a rough trip. Claire, get anything you want to take with you. Ralph will take you to where you'll be safe for a while. But the store, Claire began. Your father has riot insurance, doesn't he? I know he does. They doubled the premium on him when he came out for Senate. Let the insurance company worry about the store. The medic and the guards moved into Chester Pelton's private rest room with the stretcher. Claire went to the desk and began picking up odds and ends, including the pistol Cardin had given her, and putting them into her handbag. "'We've got to keep her away from her father for a few days, Ralph,' he told Prestonby softly. "'It's all over town that she can read and write. We've got to give him a chance to cool off before he sees her again. Take her to Lansdale. I have everything fixed up.' She'll be admitted to the fraternities this afternoon and given literate protection. Prestonby grabbed his hand impulsively. Frank, I'll never be able to repay you for this, not if I live to be a thousand, he began. There was a sudden blast of sound from overhead, the banging of machine guns, the bark of the store's twenty-millimeter auto cannon, the howling of airplane jets, and the crash of explosions. Everybody in the room jerked up and stood frozen. Then Prestonby jumped for the TV screen and pawed at the dials. A moment later, after the screen flashed and went black twice, they were looking across the topside landing stage from a pickup at one corner. A slim fighter-bomber, with square-tipped, back-swept wings, was jetting up in almost perpendicular flight. Another was coming in toward the landing stage, and, as they watched, a flight of rockets leaped forward from under its wings. Cardin saw the orderly driver of the ambulance jump down and start to run for the open lift shaft. He got five steps away from his vehicle. Then the rockets came in, and one of them struck the tarpaulin-covered pile of boxes beside the ambulance. There was a flash of multicolored flame in which the man and the vehicle he had left both vanished. Immediately the screen went black. The fireworks had mostly exploded at the first blast. However, when Cardin and Major Slater and one or two others reached the top landing stage, there were still explosions. A thing the size and shape of a two-gallon kettle covered with red paper came rolling toward them and suddenly let go with a blue-green flash, throwing a column of smoke in miniature imitation of an A-bomb into the air. Something about three feet long came whizzing at them on the end of a tail of fire, causing them to fling themselves flat. Involuntarily, Cardin's head jerked about, and his eyes followed it until it blew up with a flash and a bang three blocks uptown. Here and there, colored fire flared, small rockets flew about, and firecrackers popped. The ambulance was gone, blown clear off the roof. 
The other copters on the landing stage were a tangled mass of wreckage. The twenty millimeter was toppled over, the gunner was dead, and one of the crew, half-dazed, was trying to drag a third man from under the overturned gun. The control tower, with the two twelve millimeter machine guns, was wrecked. The two seven millimeters that had been left on the top had vanished, along with the machine gunners, in a hole that had been blown in the landing stage. Cardin, Slater, and the others dashed forward and pulled the auto cannon off the injured man, hauling him and his companion over to the lift. The two rakish winged fighter bombers were returning, spraying the roof with machine gun bullets, and behind them came a procession of fifteen big copters. They dropped the lift hastily. Slater jumped off when it was still six feet above the floor and began shouting orders. Falk, take ten men and get to the head of this lift shaft. Burdick, Levine, get as many men as you can in thirty seconds and get up to the head of the escalator. Diaz, go down and tell Sternberg to bring all his gang up here. Cardin caught up a rifle and rummaged for a bandolier of ammunition, losing about a minute in the search. The delay was fortunate. When he got to the escalators, he was met by a rush of men hurrying down the ascending spiral or jumping over onto the descending one. Sono guns! one of them was shouting they have the escalator head covered you'll get knocked out before you get off the spiral he turned and looked toward the freight lift it was coming down again with falk and his men unconscious on it knocked senseless by bludgeons of inaudible sound and a half a dozen of the copter-borne raiders all wearing the white robes and hoods of the independent conservative storm troops he swung his rifle up and began squeezing the trigger, remembering to first make sure that the fire control lever was set forward for semi-auto, and remembering his advice to Goodkin that morning. By the time the platform had stopped, all the men in white robes were either dead or wounded, and none of the unconscious literate guards along with them had been injured. The medic who had come with Cardin, assisted by a couple of the office force, got the casualties sorted out. There was nothing that could be done about the men who had been sono-stunned, in half an hour or so, they would recover consciousness with no ill effects that a couple of headache tablets wouldn't set right. The situation, while bad, was not immediately desperate. If the white-clad raiders controlled the top landing stage, they were pinned down by the firearms and sono guns of the defenders below, who were in a position to stop anything that came down the escalators or the lift shaft. The fate of the first party was proof of that and the very magnitude of the riot guaranteed that somebody on the outside city police state guards or even consolidated states regulars would be taking a hand shortly the air attack and copter landing on the roof had been excellent tactics but it had been a serious policy blunder as long as the disturbance had been confined to the interior of the store the city police could shrug it off as another minor riot on property supposed to be protected by private police and do nothing about it the rocket attack on the top landing stage, and the spectacular explosion of the fireworks temporarily stored there, however, was something that simply couldn't be concealed or dismissed. The cloud of vari-colored smoke alone must have been visible all over the five original boroughs of the older New York, and there were probably rumors of atom bombing going around. What gets me, Slater, who must have been thinking about the same thing, said to Cardin, is where they got hold of those two fighter bombers. That kind of stuff isn't supposed to be in private hands. A couple of hundred years ago, they had something they called the Sullivan Law, Cardin told him. Private citizens weren't even allowed to own pistols. But the gangsters and hoodlums seemed to be able to get hold of all the pistols they wanted, and burp guns, too. I know of four or five rocket gangs in this area that have aircraft like that, based up in the Adirondacks, at secret fields, Anybody who has connections with one of those gangs can order an air attack like this on an hour's notice, if he's able to pay for it. What I can't understand is the independent conservatives doing anything like this. The facts about this business will be all over the state before the polls open tomorrow. He snapped his fingers suddenly. Come on, let's have a look at those fellows who came down on the lift. There were two dead men in white independent conservative robes and hoods, lying where they had been dragged from the lift platform. Cardin pulled off the hoods and zipped open the white robes. One of the men was a complete stranger. The other, however, was a man he had seen earlier in the day at the Manhattan headquarters of the Radical Socialist Party, one of the Consolidated Illiterates Organization people, a follower of West and Yingling. So that's how it was, he said, straightening. Now I get it. 
let's go see if any of those wounded goons are in condition to be questioned. End of section 5section six of null a b c this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by karina schultz null a b c by h beam piper and john j mcguire ray pelton and doug yetzko had their heads out an open window on the right side of the cab of the copter truck ray was pointing down that roof over there looks like a good place to land he said we can get down the fire escape and the hatch to the conveyor belt is only half a block away yetzko nodded there'd be a watchman or a private cop in the building on which ray intended landing a couple of hundred dollars would take care of him and they could leave two of mason's boys with the vehicles to see that he stayed bribed sure we can get in on the freight conveyor he asked maybe it'll be guarded then we'll have to crawl in through the cable conduit ray said i've done that lots of times so have most of the other guys he nodded toward the body of the truck behind where his dozen odd teenage recruits were riding i've played all over the store ever since i've been big enough to walk i must know more about it than anybody but the guy who built it that's why i said we'd have to bring bullet guns down where we're going we'd gas ourselves with gas guns and if we use sono guns we'd knock ourselves out with the echo you know ray you'll make a real stormtrooper yetzko said if you manage to stay alive for another ten years, you'll be almost as good a stormtroop captain as Captain Prestonby. That, Ray knew, was about as high praise as Doug Yetzko could give anybody. He'd have liked to ask Doug more about Captain Prestonby. Doug could never seem to get used to the idea of his officer being a schoolteacher. But there was no time. The copter truck was already settling onto the roof. The watchman proved amenable to reason. He took one look at Yetzko, with three feet of weighted fire hose in his hand, and gulped, then accepted the two C-notes Yetzko gave him. They left a couple of literate guards with the vehicles, and Ray led the way to the fire escape and down into the alley. A few hundred feet away there was an iron grating which they pulled up. Ray drew the pistol he had gotten out of Captain Prestonby's arms locker and checked the magazine, chamber, and safety, knowing that Yetzko and the other guards were watching him critically and then started climbing down the ladder. The conduit was halfway down. Yetzko, climbing behind him, examined it with his flashlight, probably wondering how he was going to fit himself into a hole like that. They climbed down onto the concrete walkway beside the conveyor belts, and in the dim light of the overhead lamps, Ray could see that the two broad belts, to and from the store, were empty, for as far as he could see, in either direction. Normally there should be things moving constantly in both directions big wire baskets full of parcels for delivery, and trash containers going out, and bales and crates and cases of merchandise, and empty delivery baskets and trash containers coming in. He pointed this out to Yetzko. Sure, the big literate guard sergeant nodded. They got control of the opening from the terminal, and they probably got a gang up at the other end, too, he shouted over the noise of the conveyor belts. I hope they haven't got into the basement of the store. If they have, I know a way to get in, Ray told him. You'd better stay here for about five minutes and let me scout ahead. We don't want to run into a big gang of them ahead. Yetzko shook his head. No, Ray. The captain told me I was to stick with you. I'll go along with you. And we better take another of these kids for a runner in case we have to send word back. Ramon, you come with us, Ray said. The rest of you stay here for five minutes, and then, if you don't hear from us, follow us. Mason, you take over, Yetzko told the guard's corporal and keep an eye out behind you we're in a sandwich here they're behind us and in front of us if anything comes at you from behind send the kids forward to the next conduit port ray and yetzko and ramon nogales started forward halfway to the next conduit port there was a smear of lubricating oil on the concrete and in it and away from it in the direction of the store they found footprints it was ramon nogales who noticed the oil on the ladder to the next conduit port you stick here Yetzko told him, and when Mason and the others come up, hold them here. Tell Mason to send one of the guards forward, and use the rest of the gang to grab anybody who comes out. Come on, Ray. At the port beyond, they halted, waiting for Mason's man to come up. 
they lost some time thereafter but they learned that the section of conduit between the two ports was empty and that the main telephone line to the store had been cut whoever had cut it had gone either forward or back away from the store a little farther on the sound of shots ahead became audible over the clanking and rattling of the conveyor belts well i guess this is where we start crawling yesko said your father's people seem to be holding the store basement against a gang in the conveyor tunnel one of the boys scouted ahead and returned to report that they could reach the next conduit port but that the section of both conveyor belts ahead of him was stopped apparently wedged yetsko stood for a moment grimacing in an effort to reach a decision i'd like to just go forward and hit them from behind he said but i don't know how many of them there are and we'd have to be careful shooting into them that we didn't shoot up your father's gang beyond them i wish well let's just go through the conduit then ray said we can slide down a branch conduit that runs a power line into the basement i'll go ahead everybody at the store knows me and they don't know you they might shoot you before they found out you were a friend before yetsko could object he started up the ladder yetsko behind him and the others following at the next conduit port they could hear shooting very plainly seeming to be in front of them at the next one the shooting seemed to be going on directly under them in the tunnel with the flashlight yetsko had passed forward to him ray could see that the dust on the concrete floor of the three foot by three foot passage between and under the power and telephone cables was undisturbed a little farther on there was an opening on the left and a power cable branched off downward at a sharp angle overhead ray was able to turn about and get his feet in front of him yetsko had to crawl on until he had passed it and then back into it after ray had entered Bracing one foot on either side, Ray inched his way down the forty-degree slope, hoping that the two-hundred-pound weight of Doug Yetsko wouldn't start sliding upon him. Ahead, he could hear voices. He drew his hands and feet away from the sides of the branch conduit and let himself slip, landing in a heap in the electrician's shop above the furnace rooms. Two men, who had been working at a bench, trying to assemble a mass of equipment into a radio, whirled, snatching weapons. Ray knew both of them sam jacobowitz and george nyman who serviced the store's communication equipment they both stared at him swearing in amazement all right doug ray called out we're in bring the gang down frank cardin and ralph prestonby were waiting at the freight elevator door when it opened and russell latterman emerged a rifle slung over one shoulder cardin stepped forward and took the rifle from him "'Come on over here, Russ,' he said, "'and don't do anything reckless.' They led him to one side. Latterman looked from one to the other apprehensively, licking his lips. "'It's all right. We're not going to hurt you, Russ,' Cardin assured him. "'We just want a few facts. Beside rigging that business with Bain, and almost killing Chet Pelton, and forcing Claire to blow her cover, how much did you have to do with this business?' "'And who put you up to it?' Prestonby wanted to know my guess is joiner and graves am i right graves latterman said joiner didn't have anything to do with it didn't know anything about it he's in charge of the retail merchandising section and any action like this would be unethical since pelton's is a client of the retail merchandising section all graves told me to do was to fix up a situation using my own judgment that would provoke a literate strike and force either claire or frank here to betray literacy but I had no idea that it would involve a riot like this. If I had, I'd have stood on literate's ethics and refused to have any part in it. That's about how I thought it would be, Cardin nodded. Graves probably was informed by literates with the independent conservatives that this riot was planned. He wanted to get our people out of the store. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't present at the extemporary meeting that reversed Bain's action in calling the strike. He handed the rifle back to Latterman i just took this in case you might get excited before i could explain and you can forget about the graves joiner opposition to pelton we had a meeting right after noon lansdale gained the upper hand joiner and graves are cooperating now the plan is to support pelton and get on the inside of the socialized literacy program when it's enacted i still think that's a suicidal policy latterman said but not as suicidal as splitting the fraternities and trying to follow two policies simultaneously I wonder if I could put a call through to Literates Hall without some of these picture readers overhearing me. You've been out of touch down in the cellar, Russ, Prestonby told him. Our telephone line's cut, and the radio is smashed. 
he told Latterman about the rocket attack on the control tower, which also housed the store's telecast station. So, we're sandwiched here. One gang has us blocked at the twelfth floor, and another gang's up on the roof trying to get down at us from above, and we've no way to communicate with the outside. We can pick up the regular telecasts, but nobody outside seems to be paying much attention to us. There's a lot of equipment down in the electrician's shop, Latterman said. Maybe we could rig up a sending set that could contact one of the telecast stations outside. That's an idea, Prestonby said. Let's see what we can do about it. They went into Pelton's office. The store owner was still lying motionless on his stretcher. Claire was fiddling with a telecast receiving set. She had just tuned out a lecture on home beautifications and had gotten the midsection of a serial in which three couples were somewhat confused over just who was married to whom. "'Nobody seems to realize what's happening to us,' she said, turning the knob again. Then she froze, as Elliot C. Mongery, this time sponsored by Park, the Miracle Cleanser, appeared on the screen. "'And it seems that the attack on Chester Pelton has picked up new complications. Somebody seems determined to wipe out the whole Pelton family, because only ten minutes ago some twenty armed men invaded the Mineola High School, where Pelton's fifteen-year-old son Raymond is a student, and forced their way to the office of literate first-class Ralph N. Prestonby, in an attempt to kidnap young Pelton.' Neither literate Prestonby, the principal, nor the Pelton boy, who was supposed to be in his office, could be found. The raiders were put to flight by the presence of mind of literate Martha B. Collins, who pressed the button which turned in the fire alarm, filling the halls with a mob of students. The interlopers fled in panic after being set upon and almost mobbed. Prestonby looked worried. "'I left Ray in my office with Doug Yetzko,' he said. "'I can't understand—' Maybe Yetzko got a tip that they were coming and got Ray out of the school, Cardin suggested. I hope he took him home. He caught himself just in time to avoid mentioning the platoon of literate guards at the Pelton home, which he was not supposed to know about. Don't worry, Claire. If anything happened to Ray, Mongery'd have been screaming about it to high heaven. That's what he's paid to do. Well, I'll stake my life on it. If anybody tried to do anything to Ray while Yetzko was with him, you'd have heard about it, Prestonby said. It'd have been a bigger battle than this one. Can't seem to find out anything about what's going on at Pelton's store, Mongery continued. Telephone and radio communication seems to be broken, and although there is continuous firing going on inside the building, the city police, who have a cordon completely around it, say that the situation in the store is well in hand. Considering Chester Pelton's attacks on the city administration, and particularly the police department, I leave to your imagination what they mean by that. We do know that a large body of unidentified plug uglies whom Police Inspector Cassidy claims are special officers are holding the conveyor line into the store at the downtown Manhattan terminal, and nobody seems to know what's going on at the other end. They have the sections of both belts at the store entrance end wedged, Latterman said, coming up at the moment. Cocosello has a barricade thrown up across the store end of the tunnel, and they have a barricade about fifty yards down the tunnel. That's where I was fighting when you called me up. Anything being done about Goldbergering up a radio sending set? Prestonby asked. Yes, I just called Cocosello, Latterman said. Fortunately, the interdepartment telephone is still working. He's put a couple of men to work and thinks he may have a set in operation in about half an hour. And if, as I much fear, Chester Pelton has been murdered, then I advise all listening to me to go to the polls tomorrow and vote the straight anarchist ticket. If we've got to have anarchy in this country, let's have anarchy for all, and not just for Grant Hamilton and his political adherents, Mongery was saying. There was a series of heavy explosions on the floor above. Everybody grabbed weapons and hurried outside, crowding onto the escalators. The floor above was a shambles, with bodies lying about, and the descending escalator was packed with white-robed attackers, who had apparently prepared for their charge by tossing down a number of heavy fragmentation bombs. Cardin had a burp gun, this time. He emptied the fifty-shot magazine into the hooded hoodlums who were coming down. Prestonby, beside him, had a heavy sono gun. He kept it trained on the head of the escalator and held the trigger back until it was empty then slapped in a fresh clip of the small blank cartridges which produced the sound waves that were amplified and altered to stunning vibrations. Still, many of the attackers got through. More were dropping down the lift platform shaft. Cardin's submachine gun ceased firing, the action open on an empty clip. 
He dropped it and yanked the heavy pistol from his shoulder holster. Then, from the direction of the freight elevator, reinforcements arrived, headed by a huge man in the black leather of the literate's guard, who swung a three-foot length of fire hose with his right hand and fired a pistol with his left, and a boy in a black and red jacket who was letting off a burp gun in deliberate, parsimonious bursts. It was a second or two before Cardin recognized them as Prestonby's bodyguard, Doug Yetzko, and Claire Pelton's brother, Ray. There were four literates guards and about a dozen boys with them, all firing with a variety of weapons. At the same time, others were arriving on the escalators from the floors below, firing as they came off. Slater's literates guards, the literates and their black-jacketed troopers of Hopkinson's store service crew, the fifteen survivors of the twenty riflemen from Macy and Gimbel's. The attackers turned and crowded onto the ascending escalator. Most of them got away, the casualties being carried up by the escalator. Doug Yetzko bounded forward and brought his fire hose down on the back of one invader's neck. Then, after a last spatter of upward-aimed shots from the defenders, there was silence. Cardin stepped forward and yanked the hood from the man whom Yetzko had knocked down, hoping that he had a stunned prisoner who could be interrogated. The man was dead, however, with a broken neck. For a moment, Cardin looked down at the heavy, brutal features of Joe West, the illiterate's organization man. If Chester Pelton got out of this mess alive and won the election tomorrow, there was going to have to be a purge in the Radical Socialist Party, and something was going to have to be done about the consolidated organization of illiterates. He turned to Yetzko. You and your gang got here just in the nick of time, he said. How did you get into the store? Through the freight conveyor, into the basement. But I thought those goons had both ends of that plugged. They did, Yetzko grinned. But Ray Pelton took us in at the middle, and we crawled through a cable conduit to get around the gang at this end. Cardin looked around quickly, in search of Ray. The boy, having come out of the excitement of battle, was looking around at the litter of dead and wounded on the blood-splashed floor. His eyes widened, and he gulped. Then, carefully setting the safety of his burp gun and slinging it, he went over and leaned against the wall, and was sick. Prestonby, with Claire Pelton beside him, started toward the white-faced, retching boy. Yetzko put out a ham-like hand to stop them. If the kid wants to be sick, let him be sick, he said. He's got a right to. I was sicker than that after my first fight, but he won't do that the next time. There isn't going to be any next time, Claire declared with maternal protectiveness. And that's what you think, Miss Claire, Yetzko told her. That boy is going to make a great stormtrooper, he declared, every bit as great as Captain Prestonby here. Claire looked up at Prestonby almost worshipfully. And I never knew anything about your being a fighting man till today, she said. Ralph, there's so much about you that I don't know. There'll be plenty of time to find out now, honey, he told her. Cardin stepped over the body of Joe West and went up to them. Sorry to intrude on you two, he said. "'But we've got to figure on how to get out of here. "'Could we get out the same way you got in?' he asked Yetzko. "'And take Mr. Pelton with us?' Yetzko frowned. "'Part of the way we got to crawl through this conduit. "'It's only about a yard square. "'And we'd have to go up a ladder and out a manhole to get out of the conveyor tunnel. "'What sort of shape's Mr. Pelton in?' "'He's under hypnotane, completely unconscious,' Prestonby said. "'Then we'd have to drag him,' Yetzko said. "'Strap him up in a tarp, or load him into a sleeping bag if we can get a hold of one.' "'There are plenty down in the warehouse,' Latterman interrupted, joining them. "'And the warehouse is in our hands.' "'All right,' Cardin decided. "'We'll take him out now and take him home. "'I have some men there who'll take care of him. "'We'll have to get you and Ray out, too,' he told Claire. "'I think we'll take both of you to Literates Hall. "'You'll be absolutely safe there.' "'But the store—' Claire started to object, and all these people who came here to help us. As soon as I have your father home, I'm going to start rounding up a gang to raise the siege, Cardin said. Radical socialist storm troops, and, <laughs> he grinned suddenly, the insurance company, the one that has the store insured against riot. Why didn't I think of them before? They're losing money every second this thing goes on. It'll be worth their while to start doing something to stop it. The trip out through the conduit was not so difficult, even with the encumbrance of the unconscious Chester Pelton, but Prestonby was convinced that, except for the giant strength of Doug Yetzko, it would have been nearly impossible. 
Ray Pelton, recovered from his after-battle nausea and steeled by responsibility, went first. Cardin crawled after him, followed by a couple of the boys. Then came Yetzko, dragging the sleeping bag in which Chester Pelton was packed like a mummy. Preston B. himself followed, pushing on his future father-in-law's feet, and Claire crawled behind with the rest of Ray's schoolmates for a rear guard. They got past the battle which was still going on at the entrance to the store basement, letting Pelton down with a rope and carrying him onto the outward-bound belt. They left it in time to assemble under the ladder leading to the alley through which Ray said they had entered, and hauled Pelton up after them. Then, when they were all out in the open again, Ray ran up the alley and mounted a fire escape, and, in a few minutes, a big copter truck which had been parked on the roof let down to them. Into this, Cardin ordered the unconscious senatorial candidate loaded, and the boys, who had come with Ray. "'I'll take him home, and then run the boys to the school,' he told Prestonby. "'You and Ray and Claire get in this other copter and go straight to Literates Hall.' He pointed up to the passenger vehicle which was hovering above, waiting for the truck to leave. "'Go in the church way, and go straight to Lansdale's office. And here,' he scribbled an address and a phone number and a couple of names. "'These men have my copter at this address. Call them as soon as you get to Literates Hall, and have them take it at once to Pelton's home on Long Island.' Prestonby nodded and watched Cardin climb into the truck. The literate's guard who was driving lifted it up and began windmilling away toward the east. The passenger copter, driven by another guard from the school, settled down. Putting Ray and Claire into it, he climbed in after them. Ray, he said, how would you like to be a real white smock literate? Ray's eyes opened. You think I'm good enough? Good enough to be a novice to start with and I don't think you'll stay a novice long. Claire looked at him inquiringly, saying nothing. You too, honey, he said. Frank fixed it all up. You and Ray will be admitted to the fraternities this afternoon, and that will remove any objection to our being married. But how about the senator? she asked. Prestonby shrugged. It's all over the state now that you can read. There's nothing that you can do about it, and Frank has a lot of influence with him. He'll talk him around to where he'll be willing to make the best of it, in a week or so. Russell Latterman noticed that Major Slater was looking at him in a respectfully inquiring manner. He said nothing, and at length the literate's guard's officer broke the silence. You didn't go out with the others. Latterman shook his head. No, Major. I'm an executive of Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise, however unlike its name it may look at the moment. My job's here. I'm afraid I'll have to lean pretty heavily on you, until Mr. Cardin can get help to us. I'm not particularly used to combat. You've been doing all right with that rifle, Slater told him. I can hit what I aim at, yes, but I'm not used to commanding men in combat, and I'm not much of a tactician. Slater thrust out his hand impulsively. I took a sort of poor view of you at first. I'm sorry, he said. Want me to take command? if you please, Major. What are you going to do after this thing's over? Slater asked. Stay on with Pelton's, provided Mr. P. doesn't find out that I organized that trick with his medicine and the safe, Latterman said. Since Lansdale seems to have gotten on top at the hall, I am, as of now, a Lansdale partisan. That's partly opportunism, and it's partly because, since a single policy has been adopted, I feel obliged to go along with it. I'll have to get the store back in operation, as soon as possible. Pelton's going to need money, badly, if he's going to try for the presidency in 44. He looked around him. You know, I've always wanted to run a fire sale. This'll be even better. A battle sale. Cardin watched Chester Pelton apprehensively as the bald-headed merchant and senatorial candidate sipped from the tall glass in his hand and then set it on the table beside him. His face was pale, and he had the look of a man who had just been hit with a blackjack. Now that's an awful load of bricks to dump on a man all at once, Frank, he said reproachfully. You'd rather I told you now than turn on the TV and hear some commentator talking about it, wouldn't you? Cardin asked. Pelton swore vilely in a lifeless monotone, cursing literacy and all literates back to the invention of the alphabet. Then he stopped short. No, Frank, I don't mean that either. My own son and daughter are literates. I can't say that about them. But how long? 
Oh, for about a year, I'd say. I understand now that they were admitted to the fraternity six months ago, he invented. And they were working against me all that time? Pelton demanded. Cardin shook his head. No, Chet, they were for you, all the way. Your daughter exposed her literacy to save your life. Your son and his teacher came to your store and fought for you. But there are literates who want to see you defeated, and they're the ones who made that audiovisual, secretly, of the ceremony in which your son and daughter took the literate's oath and received the white smock, and they're going to telecast it this evening at 2100. Coming on top of the stories that have been going around all afternoon, and Slade Gardner's speech this morning, they think that'll be enough to defeat you. Well, don't you? Pelton gloomed. My own kids, literates. He seemed to have reached a point at which he was actually getting a masochistic pleasure out of turning the dagger in his wounds. Who'd trust me after this? No, Chet, it isn't enough to beat you. If you just throw away that crying towel and start fighting, they made one mistake that's going to wreck them. What's that, Frank? Pelton brightened by about one angstrom unit. The timing, of course, Cardin told him impatiently. I thought you'd see that at once. This telecast comes on at 2100. Your final speech comes on at 2130. As soon as they've shown this business of Claire and Ray taking the literate oath, you'll be on the air yourself, and if you put on any kind of a show worth the name, it won't be safe for anybody in this state to be caught wearing a white smock. Now, if they'd only had the wit to wait till after you'd delivered that speech you've been practicing on for the last two weeks, and then sprang this on you, that would have been different. They'd have had you over a barrel. But this way, you have them. Pelton took another gulp from the tall glass at his elbow, emptying it. Fix me up another of these, Frank, he said. I feel like a new man already. Then his face clouded again. But we have no time to prepare a speech now, and I just can't ad-lib one. Cardin drew a little half-inch record disc from his pocket case. Play this off, he said. I had it fixed up as soon as I got wise to what was going to happen. The voice is one of the girls in my office over at the brewery. Pronunciation, grammar, elocution, and everything correct. Pelton snapped the disc onto his recorder and put in the earplug. Then, before he pressed the stud, he looked at Cardin curiously. How'd you get onto this anyhow, Frank? He wanted to know. Well, I hope you don't ask me for an accounting of all the money I've been spending in this campaign, because some of the items would look funny as hell, but... No accounting, Frank. After all, you spent as much of your own money as you did of mine, Pelton interrupted. But I bought myself a pipeline into Literates Hall, big enough to chase an elephant through. Cardin went on, ignoring the interruption. This fellow Mongery, for instance. Elliot Mongery was one of literate Frank Cardin's best friends. He comforted his conscience with the knowledge that Mongery would slander him just as unscrupulously if the interests of the Lansdale plan were at stake. I have Mongery, just like this. He made a clutching and lifting gesture as though he were picking up some small animal by the scruff of the neck. So as soon as I got word of it, I started getting this thing together. It isn't the kind of a job a literate semanticist would do, but it's all honest, illiterate thinking in illiterate language. Turn it on, and tell me what you think of it. While Pelton listened to the record, Cardin mixed him another of the highballs, adding a little of the heart stimulant the medic had given him. Pelton was grinning savagely when he turned off the little machine and took out the earplug. Great stuff, Frank and I won't have to ham it much. It's just about the way I feel. He thought for a moment. You have me talking about my ruined store there. Just how bad is it, anyhow? Pretty bad, Chet. Latterman says it's going to take some time to get it fixed up, but he expects to be open for business by Thursday or Friday. He's going to put on a big battle sale. He says it's going to make retail merchandising history, and the insurance covers most of the damage. Well, tell me about it. How did you get the riot stopped after you got me out? And how did you... Cardin shook his head. You play that record over again. Get yourself in the mood. When you go on, we'll have you in a chair, wrapped in a blanket. You're supposed to have crawled back out of the valley of the shadow of death to make this speech, 
and we'll have the wire run down inside the blanket so that you can listen to the speech while you're giving it. Chet, this is going to be one of the great political speeches of all time. Literate William R. Lansdale looked up from his desk and greeted his visitor with a smile. Well, Frank, sit down and accept congratulations. I suppose you got the returns? Cardin nodded, dropping into a chair beside the desk. Just came from campaign headquarters. This automatic tally system they use on the voting machines is really something. Complete returns, tabulated and reported for the whole state within forty minutes after the polls closed. I won't be silly enough to ask you if you got the returns. I deserved that, of course, Lansdale chuckled. Can I offer you refreshment? A nice big stein of Cardin's black bottle, for instance? Cardin shuddered and grimaced horribly. I've been drinking that slop by the bucketful all day, and Pelton's throwing a victory party tonight, and I'll have to choke down another half-gallon of it. Give me a cup of coffee and one of those good cigars of yours. Lansdale grinned at him. Ah, yes, the jolly brewer, his own best advertisement. How's Pelton reacting to his triumph? And what's his attitude towards his children? I've been worrying about that. Vestigial traces of a conscience, I suppose. Well, I had to keep him steamed up till after he went off the air, Cardin said. Chet isn't a very good actor. But after that, I talked to him like a Dutch uncle, told him what a swell pair of kids and a fine son-in-law he had. He got sore at me, tried to throw me out of the house a couple of times. I was afraid he was going to have another of those attacks. But by the time Ralph and Claire got back from their honeymoon and Ray finishes that cram course for literate prep school, he'll be ready to confer the paternal blessing all around. I'm going to stay in town and make sure of it, and then I'm taking about a month's vacation. You've earned it, all right. Lansdale poured Cardin's coffee and passed him the cigar humidor. How's Pelton's attitude toward the consolidated illiterates organization now? Cardin, having picked up the Italian stiletto to puncture his cigar, looked at it carefully to make sure that it really had no edge, and then drew it quickly across his throat. Just like that. You know what really happened yesterday afternoon at the store, don't you? Well, in general, yes. I wish you'd fill me in on some of the details, though, Frank. Details he wants. <laughs> well, Cardin blew on his coffee and sipped it. The way we played it for propaganda purposes, of course, there was only one big riot, and it was all the work of the wicked literates and their independent conservative hirelings. Actually, there were two riots. First, there was one the independents had planned for about a week in advance. That was the one Sforza tipped us on, the one that started in China. Graves knew about it, enough to advise Latterman to get all the literates out of the store before noon, which Latterman did, with trimmings. Then there was another riot, masterminded by a couple of illiterates organization action committee people named Joe West and Horace Yingling, both deceased. That was the result of Latterman's bright idea to trap Claire and or me into betraying literacy. These illiterate fanatics made up their minds, to speak rather loosely, that the whole Pelton family were literates, including Chet himself. They decided that it was better to kill off their candidate and use him for a martyr two years from now than to elect him and have him sell them out. They got about a hundred or so of their goons dressed in independent conservative KKK costumes, bought air support from Patsy Cazallo's mob up in Vermont, and made that attack on the top landing stage after starting a fake riot in North Jersey to draw off the regular radical socialist storm troops. Incidentally, when I found out it was Calazzo's gang that furnished those fighter bombers, I hired another mob to go up and drop a blockbuster on Calazzo's field to teach him to keep his schnozzle out of politics. Lansdale nodded briskly. That I approve of. How about West and Yingling? Prestonby's muscle man, Yetzko, killed West. I took care of Comrade Yingling myself after I'd gotten reinforcements to the store. First, a couple of freelance storm troops that the insurance company hired, and then as many of the radical rangers as I could gather up. And Pelton knows about all this? He certainly does. After this caper, the illiterates' organizations threw, as far as any consideration or patronage from the radicals is concerned. Well, that's pretty nearly the best thing I've heard out of the whole business, Lansdale said. 
in about eight or ten years we may want to pull the independent conservative party together again to cash in on public dissatisfaction with pelton's socialized literacy program which ought to be coming apart at the seams by then and if we have the illiterate split into two hostile factions cardin finished his coffee well chief i've got to be getting along o'reilly can only cover me for a short while and i have to be getting to this victory party of pelton's lansdale rose and shook hands with him i can't tell you too many times what a fine job you did frank he said i hope no knowing you i'm positive that you'll be able to engineer a reconciliation between pelton and his son and daughter and young prestonby and then have yourself a good vacation i mean to i'm going deer hunting to a place up in the mountains along the old pennsylvania new york state line a little community of about a thousand people where everybody men women and children can read lansdale was interested a community of literates cardin shook his head not literates with a big l just people who can read and write he replied it's a kind of back eddy sort of place and i imagine a couple of hundred years ago the community was too poor to support one of those progressive school systems that made illiterates out of the people in the cities probably couldn't raise enough money in school taxes to buy all the expensive audiovisual equipment so they had to use old-fashioned textbooks and teach the children to read from them they have radios and tv of course but they also have a little daily paper and they have a community library lansdale was thoughtful for a moment you know frank there must be quite a few little enclaves of lowercase literacy like that in backwoods and mountain communities especially in the west and south i'm going to make a project of finding such communities helping them and getting recruits from them they'll fit into the plan well i'll be seeing you some time tomorrow i suppose he watched cardin go out and then poured a glass of port for himself and sipped slowly holding the glass to the light and watching the ruby glow it cast on the desktop it had been over thirty years ago when he had been old jules de chambard's assistant that the plan had been first conceived de chambord was dead these twenty years and he had taken the old man's place and they had only made the first step things would move faster now but he would still die before the plan was completed and frank cardin whom he had marked as his successor would be an old man and somebody like young ray pelton would be ready to replace him but the plan would go on until everybody would be literate not literate and illiteracy not illiteracy would be a mark of social stigma and most people would live their whole lives without personal acquaintance with an illiterate there were a few years yet to prepare for the next step the white smocks would have to go literates would have to sacrifice their paltry titles and distinctions there would have to be a reconstitution of the fraternities wilton joyner and harvey graves and other conservative literates would have to be convinced emotionally as well as intellectually of the need for change there were a few of the older brothers who could never adjust their thinking they would have to be promoted to positions with higher salaries and more impressive titles and no authority whatever but that was all a matter of tactics the younger men like frank cardin and elliot mongery and ralph prestonby could take care of that certain changes would occur a stable and peaceful order of society for one thing a rule of law and the liquidation of these goon gangs and storm troops and private armies if a beginning at that were made tomorrow using the battle at pelton's store to mobilize public opinion it would still take two decades to get anything really significant done and a renaissance of technological and scientific progress today the manufacturers change the copter models twice a year and except for altering the shape of a few chromium plated excrescences or changing the contours slightly they were the same copters that had been buzzing over the country at the time of the third world war every month the pharmaceutical companies announced a new wonder drug and if it wasn't sulfa it was penicillin and if it wasn't penicillin it would be aromycin why most of the scientific research was being carried on by a few literates in the basements of a few libraries rediscovering the science of two centuries ago he sighed and finished his port and as he did probably once every six months he refilled the glass 
He'd be seventy-two next birthday. Maybe he'd live long enough to see. End of Section 6 of Null ABC and End of Null ABC